Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My computer wouldn't go unmuted. Welcome to the County Planning Committee for Durham County Council held this the second day of March 2021. My name is John Robinson. I'm the County Councillor for Sedgefield and I chair the Planning Committee. I have with me the Vice Chairman, Councillor Mr Fraser Tinsley, who represents Wellington and Hunwick. And Fraser will take over if anything goes wrong with my connection until I'm reconnected. Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome all the county councillors, both as members of the committee and other members wishing to speak today. May I specifically thank all the officers who are about to present this morning to us and also to the members of the public who are speaking either for or against. We appreciate the input the members of the public are giving us in this morning's meeting. And may I also reassure those members of the public who have emailed the members of the committee over the last few days, members of the committee have read your emails. So what I ask is if you are not speaking, could you please put your microphone on mute and make sure that you uh, take the unmute off when you're about to speak, not like what happened to me. And also, if you wish, you may also go and take your camera off. But clearly, if you are about to speak, it would be grateful if you could put your camera on so members can see you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with item one. Item one is the location is the Hilltop Farm, Winston, Darlington. And can I hand over to Chris, Chris Shields, who is the officer who is about to present the application. Thank you very much, Chris, for what you're about to do. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just open the presentation now. Chris, while you're opening it, I've just been reminded, can we do, first of all, apologies for absence? Ian? Chair, we have no apologies for absence today. Any Ooh. substitute members? No substitute members in attendance. Any declarations of interest? No. Therefore, minutes of the meeting held on the 1st of December. Can we agree? Thank you very much. And Ian, thank you very much. It, me and my excitement to get on with the applications. It's great to have someone like you Ian, to bring me back to the agenda. We all yours now, Chris. OK. <clears throat> OK, this application is for the retention of existing building for permanent use as a plasterboard recycling facility and retention of existing Bund at Hilltop Farm at Winston. Planning permission was originally granted for plasterboard recycling at Hilltop Farm in 2011 with a restriction of 10,000 tonnes per year. Planning permission was subsequently granted in 2015 for a new building and temporary consent to use this and an existing building for plasterboard recycling for five years. This application seeks to make permanent the use of the site for plasterboard recycling, whilst also regularising the dimensions and position of the larger building approved in 2015. This building is two metre wider and approved 0.4 metres shorter to the ridge line, and located approximately 8 metres further east. There is also an additional section joining the two buildings together. The screening mount to the south of the site is larger than originally anticipated and would also be regularised by this application. The process is set out in detail in the committee report. However, as a brief overview, the purpose of the facility is to import and recycle waste plasterboard. Plasterboard can't easily be, be disposed of in landfill and is difficult to process in a mixed waste recycling facility. The facility at Hilltop Farm imports plasterboard from the north of England and Scotland uh, and some from Northern Ireland as well. This material is processed through crushion, screening and picking to, reduce, to produce a granular gypsum and paper product. In excess of 99% of the imported waste is diverted away from disposal. Approximately 80% of the gypsum product is used in agriculture as a soil conditioner, with the remaining 20% being used in industrial applications or other products. 80% of the material used in agriculture is distributed within a 15 mile radius of the site. Since the publication of the committee report last week, there are some updates for you to be aware of. First, there is a correction. The paragraph two or three of the of the first sentence in the report refers to the B1280 road, and this should refer to the B6274. There are also updates to the letters of objection and support that I'll refer to later in the presentation. I'm also aware that copies of four petitions from the villages of Winston, Caldwell, Fawcett, Winston Gate and Ovington have been sent to members via an objector. 
And just to note, the committee have had a request to carry out a site visit, but due to the current COVID restrictions, this has not been possible. The application site is located on land to the immediate northeast of Hilltop Farm, approximately 800 metres to the southwest of the village of Winston. The site is accessed from the B6274 road via a private access track. Traffic from the site reaches either the A67 road to the north via the village of Winston or the A66 trunk road to the south via the villages of Caldwell and Fawcett. The application site consists of two interconnected buildings, a yard and a weir bridge. The screening mount to the south is shown on this aerial photograph as well, um, but it, this was an earlier photograph and it's now uh, has an established grass sward on it, so it's greened up. This is a, a view of the site looking to the north. The screen mount can be seen in the bottom of the picture here, and you can also hopefully see an HGV being cleaned in the yard prior to leaving the site. This is a view from within the site looking south towards the screening mound. This is a view of the site looking east. Uh, and this is a view of the site looking west towards the B6274 road. This is a view of the site entrance from the B6274. This was upgraded as a requirement of the 2015 Planning Commission and a new hedgerow has been planted. As you can see the, the tree guards around the, the entrance there. Statutory internal and neighbouring authority consultees have raised no objections subject, subject to conditions where appropriate. Winston and Hutton Magna Parish Councils from Durham and Caldwell, Caldwell Parish Council from North Yorkshire have objected primarily due to concerns regarding traffic suitability of the site for the use and the risk of future expansion. The campaign for the protection of rural England have objected, considering the site to be in the wrong location and stated impacts to immunity, road users, including cyclists, and how far the material is transported to the site. Objections from 114 members of the public uh, raise issues including traffic, site location, landscape and visual impact, heritage, noise, dust, and hydrology. Reference to complaints made in respect of the application process and enforcement issues raised in relation to the operation of the site. Since the publication of the report, 12 further objection letters have been received from people who had previously objected and three additional letters were received, two of which are their requests are being retained as confidential. Four petitions have also been received from the villages of Winston, Caldwell, Fawcett, Winston Gate and Ovington via objection, with a total of 237 signatures. No new issues have been raised in relation to the application that have not been addressed in the report. Business Durham support the proposal, noting that the significant investment made by the applicant and the 15 full-time jobs would be safeguarded by the proposal. 160 letters of support have been received from customers, suppliers, employees and local residents stating the value of the site for waste recycling, supply of gypsum soil conditioner for agriculture and for ensuring secure employment. 25 of these letters were received after the publication of the report. Objectors have criticised the letters of support for being anonymous and for all being forwarded to the council by the applicant. Objectors have carried out an analysis of the support letters and noted that the selection of these letters are repeats of those submitted earlier in the determination process. I can confirm that original unredacted versions of the support letters have been viewed by two council officers. They have all been received from different individuals or companies. The applicant forwarded the letters with identifiable data removed to protect customers and suppliers. The resubmit letters were not recounted in the total, which is still 160. The development will allow for the retention of a nationally significant specialist waste recycling facility, providing local and regional self-sufficiency for managing plasterboard waste. In excess of 99% of the waste stream would be diverted away from landfill and driven up the waste hierarchy. Additionally, the production of agricultural soil conditioner from the plasterboard waste for an established market in close proximity to the site. The development would continue to operate using established buildings and processing plants on a site that has the benefit of an existing environmental permit. 
The potential impacts of the development have been fully assessed and found to be acceptable, subject to conditions where appropriate. Significant public interest reflecting issues and concerns from objectors to the proposal, as well as from supporters. Representations received have been taken into account, along with other responses, including those of statutory consultees, that have raised no objections to the proposal, subject to conditions where appropriate. Whilst mindful of the nature and weight of public concerns, it is considered that these are not su sufficient to outweigh the planning judgment in favour of the proposals. The proposal has been demonstrated to be fully policy, policy compliant and would facilitate the continued operation of a nationally significant waste site whilst retaining 15 full time jobs. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. So we now move on to the our speakers. And I'm, first of all, Mr. Cook, can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Mr. Cook, are you, I, I need to apologise because my records don't tell me. Are you the parish clerk or are you a councillor? Uh, I am the vice chairman of Winston Parish Council. So, sir, from now on, you will be called Councillor Cook and given the title you're entitled to. So good morning, Councillor Cook. On behalf of the committee, we would like to hand over to you now to give your presentation. Right. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that I attended both the 2011 application relating to AgriCorp and also was in County Hall in 2015 when the full Durham Planning Committee granted what was then described as a temporary application for a farm diversification activity which had very clear conditions attached. In respect of that, today's application appears to be something which is seeking to completely overturn the decision that was made by the full Planning Committee. That decision clearly stated that all waste processing on this site had to end by 2020 and that the site had to be restored to agricultural use. Winston Parish Council accepted the decision at that point. We trusted in the process and we believed and trusted in the, the Durham County Council Planning Committee. As far as we are concerned, nothing has happened in the interim to change that decision. We believe it was the correct decision at the time and that the conditions attached to it were the correct conditions. What has now happened is that five year planning permission has expired. The conditions attached to it have been completely ignored by the applicant. And as far as we are aware, Durham County Council has made no attempt to enforce those conditions based on the, what I would regard as the promise we were given in 2000. On that site should have finished, the site should have been restored to agricultural use and a very valuable waste processing facility should have been relocated. That 2015 decision is sitting there with the conditions unfulfilled. This application seeks to completely to overturn that uh, decision and to just wipe away those conditions. What's happened in the interim? Agricourse operation has been allowed to grow enormously as it was between 2011 and 2015. It was processing over twice the amount of material it was licensed for by the time of that 2015 application from an open shed. Since then, they've been allowed to do what they wanted by all of uh, 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 to all the attempts and purposes without any attempt to either ensure that they have moved to a different site. We're not asking for the, the business to close, just to move to a more suitable site. And that seems to be forgotten in the, the whole discussion. So as we say, since 2015, it has continued to grow enormously. It's not a local facility. Agricor claim that their process from Northern Ireland, the whole of Scotland, all of Cumbria, some, some from Wales and some from Yorkshire and Humberside. Only a quarter of the waste originates in the Northeast, let alone County Durham. That seems to conflict with the Durham County Council waste management policy. The amount of recycling being created also far exceeds local need. There isn't a flotilla of local farmers rushing up to Hilltop Farm with trailers 
to carry away gypsum. It's going away in HGVs. Why does the plant need minor road access when both its input and output are the county? It should be on a major road junction somewhere where that is more Councillor uh, Cook, Councillor Cook, can I interrupt? Yes. So we've lost you three times. Um, the first two were about were very slight, and we could understand what you say. Can you right. go back to? I think it was the word when, why in your speech. Uh, I can't think where that might be. I'm happy to carry on. Uh, the, uh, as long as you've got the point about the expansion. That's um, fine, sir. I just didn't yeah. want you to feel that we hadn't listened. Thank you very much, but, sir. Off you go. Yeah, I'll carry on then. So the, the amount, there is local farmers rushing in and out of Hilltop Farm with little trailers. It's all going by HGV in, in the main. Uh, the support from the local farmers isn't evident in this application as it was in 2015. So where is the, the product going? When you look at the what information we're allowed to have, which is the names on the lorries, the HGVs are coming from a very long way away. If you were a local farmer taking gypsum, you wouldn't be hiring an HGV from 100 miles away to take it. But as I said, we're not allowed access to that information. Uh, the redacted letters uh, that are on the site in terms of support are coming from, uh, we are told, from farmers and from hauliers, but we don't know where exactly they are coming from. Do the council know that? Because if they're not local, it, it, it goes against the principle that this site has to be in this specific location. A waste processing site somewhere in the northeast, fine. There is no evidence for it to have to be on this particular site. We were 2020, it hasn't been. Local people are quite happy to put their names and addresses on, on, on the complaints that they've raised. 110 people signed up to, to a petition within the last week, but all the alleged support is unverified and secret. It does, it does raise a question. And then to go on to some of the, the documents that have been produced within Durham County Council. So we need you to start, you, you've well over the five minutes that others are going to have. We need you to start come to some conclusion, if you don't mind. I'll be quick then. Uh, Thank you very Durham's much. Durham's own spatial policy team say that, say that this is a waste management operation. It's not commensurate with farm diversification. There are lots of other issues about the power source and at the end of the day in 2015 i feel we were given a promise and I, as the village and as the local community and i feel that this process is denying that promise and reversing that decision and there is no reason other than the fact that durham county council made a total or that this process is flawed why this application today should be allowed on behalf of the people of Winston, I would ask that this application is turned down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cook, uh, for that. Normally we would get uh, the officer to reply, but I've only got one of the county councillors recent to speak. So if we bring Councillor Rawlinson in and then we'll get Mr Shields to respond to both you and Jim. Good morning, Jim. Can you start, sir? We're over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, one of the most um, talked about and, uh, and, and probably divisive uh, planning applications um, I've, uh, I've been involved in. Um, I, uh, I was one of the uh, supporters of the, uh, of the original application uh, five years ago um, and it's, uh, it seems to have turned into uh, something that's um, I don't know. Uh, there's there's some malicious um, and divisive uh, behaviour uh, coming with it. Um, suffice to say that um, one of the objectors uh, rang my county chairman uh, of the Conservatives to um, object to the not being having support from me 
and uh, would like to replace me as the uh, as the <laughs> in the next uh, uh, upcoming election, uh, which I find uh, unbelievable. Um, and, and and she is quite uh, uh, vociferous in her objections to this, and has probably uh, been the lead leader of all the objections and speaking later. Um, I would ask the uh, officers, uh, Chris Shields, um, the, the letters of support that he's received, um, knowing uh, the amount of um, vilification that this um, uh, application has received, um, the, uh, the, the letters of support have been kept, the names have been kept back for the reason of um, it being, uh, you know, not wanting people to be rung up and um, and and ask why they are supporting it. Um, and and I would also ask, um, since um, since it was first originally given its uh, its uh, permissions five years ago, um, has there been any objections uh, to the way it's been run or with any uh, mishaps? And uh, in their opinion, has it been uh, run uh, well as a business and 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 uh, tried to keep it as tidy as possible? Um, I had a, a a constructive meeting with the uh, with the parish council last week. Uh, we had a, a tremendous dialogue of uh, of their opinions and how they. Uh, they are disappointed in the, uh, and I, I can imagine the amount of traffic that they have to put up with, is is possibly the the, the worst thing there is, um, and uh, and we uh, we we had a conversation for uh, three quarters of an hour or more, and I would, uh, as uh, Jim has already spoken, I would uh, I would like to uh, support the parish council in uh, asking the committee to uh, refuse the uh, the application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Rawlinson. Jim, it's both James, funny enough. Thank you very much, Councillor Rawlinson and Councillor Cook. Can we move to Chris? Chris Shields and Chris, would you like to come back on any of the comments that have been made? Clearly, you don't. You clearly you're not involved in any of the political comments. It's purely in regards to the planning. That, that's fine, Chairman. Um, uh, just to clarify the basis on which the the application was time limited um, in 2015. It wasn't time limited by the council. The applicant actually made an application for five years, uh, and on that basis, we put a condition on that it would it would be that time frame. It wasn't a decision or, or an assessment by the council. That was the the maximum time that would be acceptable. It was just what had been asked for. Um, so it is correct that the applicant is now put in an application to extend that in, indeed for permanent use. Um, and based on the, the performance of uh, how they've operated, um, there have been some difficulties early in the process um, before they got their, their building established. You know, we'd had some, a few dust issues um, and a few, com few complaints in 2017 and 2018 to ourselves, Environmental Health and the Environment Agency, We're talking the numbers of three to four to each authority. And then in 2019, we didn't receive any complaints at all once the, the business had established in the new building. Following the submission of the, um, the current application, we received a, uh, an influx of, of complaints, um, all of which we've unsubstantiated, um, and some of that are still ongoing, which would be um, resolved as part of this, this determination process. Those relate to the position and size of the building, and vehicle movements, which have been intended to be regularised by this application. Um, then just to clarify on, on the letters of support, I set out in my presentation that um, myself and another officer from the council have seen uh, the unredacted versions of the support letters, and we can confirm that they are accurate, they are real, they haven't been made up, um, and they are from local farmers and businesses, um, as, as well as some that are from further afield. In terms of where the material goes, we've seen the, the data which shows it where, where it's dis distributed to local farms, where they're located. Um, and I can confirm that 8% of the gypsum that is produced at the site 
does go to farms within a 15 mile radius. Um, at, a, at a much shorter distance, i.e. five miles, that's down to 20%. And then you've got the, the further uh, remaining 20% to farms beyond 15 miles. But as with any waste uh, product or the, the material they're making, the, the, the value of it is on the in, input. So the, the output material is very low value. And the further you have to distribute it, the, the more it costs the, um, the applicant to do that. So it's not in their interest to distribute a long distance. And that's why the material goes to this um, short radius around the site. Um, I think that's all, Chen. Thank you, Chris. Alan, at this point, normally members wouldn't come in. Is it a point of order you wish to um, raise? John, it was just for, yeah, I don't know if it's at this stage, just for the officer in relation to the conditions, just rather than further in the debate, which has been referred to which um, James re referred to earlier. I don't bring it in later if that's appropriate. Thank you, Alan, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I'm afraid, Mr. Council Cook, I'm about to upset you. Uh, you're not allowed to see anything yeah. more. I've got, you've got your hand up, but I'm afraid yeah. you've had your time and I'm not, I can't take anything, so I really apologise. So we now move on to the two objectors. Can I welcome Mrs. Kate Nichols, who I believe is going first, and then Mr. Angus Thompson. Um, Good morning to both of you. So I know you both know it's two and a half minutes. So if we begin with you, Mrs. Nichols. Okay, hello, my name is Kate Nichols. I live near the plant and I'm representing the uh, local residents. There are many objections from residents to this application. They are all genuine, not anonymous like the support letters. They give individual accounts of the impact this site has on our daily lives. The B6274 used to be a quiet road. It is the only way we can get about, so it is absolutely vital to us. It also links our footpaths, such as the Teesdale Way, and our many bridle paths. The volume of wagons now on this narrow road means that we cannot walk or ride on it in the way we used to. The council dismissed this in the report, but this does not mean it isn't true. These objections all go to the heart of the planning issue here. Is this a sustainable location for a waste facility? The applicant knows it's in the wrong place. It's why they applied for temporary use in the, first, in the first place and promised to move. The alleged site search looked only at locations close to farms, not for easy access to the arisings, which is the main source of income for the business. The agricultural input, as Chris Shields mentioned, is of actual minimal financial value. So I have four points to make. Over half the road is too narrow for two-way traffic, goes over two pack horse bridges, as well as Winston Bridge, it runs through villages, including an already bypassed one, and the wagons have a significant impact on the amenity of these quiet rural settlements. This site is served by HGVs. This is not sustainable. The majority of the recyclet goes to destinations over five miles away and is transported by wagons. This means that good access to a main trunk road is a necessity. The B6274 does not provide good access. This is not a satisfactory location. Further, the site is powered by diesel generators. The council argue that to refuse on this basis would set a precedent as many rural businesses face the same issue. This is disingenuous at best. This is not a rural business. It is a waste facility. It could be anywhere. Promoting you have 30 seconds left. Diesel generators contradicts all the council's policies. The, council, the shed is built to agricultural standards, not designed for plaster board processing. And to ignore these policies and grant permission risks establishing the principle that the land owner could gain industrial use on agricultural land via this temporary route. If permitted, this industrial site will stand as a monument to the council's complacency and expediency. We ask the committee to recommend refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nichols, for sticking to the time. And you haven't seen it because you were reading your speech, but we do have your photographs in front of us. We now just... move on to uh, Mr. Thompson. I know you're Councillor Thompson from uh, another authority. So good morning, Councillor Thompson. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can hear me, can't you? Yeah. Yes, sir, we yes, can. Right. Good morning, uh, councillors. Uh, I'm Angus Thompson. I'm the North Yorkshire County Councillor uh, for Richmondshire North. My division covers basically from the Durham North, North Yorkshire border between Winston and Caldwell to the outskirts of Richmond. No one in the, on the Durham County Council Planning Committee will need me to tell you that the application in front of you this morning is high, highly controversial and indeed emotive and has been this from day one. 
I had a meeting with two Durham County Council planning officers on 12th of August last year, and Andrew Inch stated quite categorically that the application was being considered, be, the application being considered today was being treated as a new application. Yet this is clearly not the case. And I'm afraid I have to say that Durham County Council officials have misled consultancies, including North Yorkshire County Council Highways. The road through Calder right to the A66 is littered with smashed signs, verges chewed up, damaged bridges because of HGVs using a wholly inappropriate, narrow, twisty priority two road. Um, and North Yorkshire Highways have been unable to place an objection to the application because it was not being treated as a new application by the Durham County Council of Planners. This is despite the, the assurance that was given to me by Andrew Inch. It is quite it has been quite clear all along that the council is very nervous of this application. You're prepared to break your own rules to let it go through. One example that I thought was put very well by Kate Nichols is the business about diesel generators. Surely you've heard of a green agenda, and if you haven't, then why don't you consult your own policy, which you appear to be happy to break? In summary, I asked members of the planning committee to refuse this application for many reasons not least the effect that HGVs are having on the local communities both in County Durham and North Yorkshire. The applicant has a superb business model, there's no doubt about that, so why don't you give him help to find a site which is not going to spoil a beautiful rural landscape, not going to dis disrupt the lives of hundreds of residents, and above all has a good road infrastructure to allow access from the main road, left. not windy lanes. I again make a plea to you, please do not put commercialism before communities. I suggest councillors you reject this application today, find a suitable site for the agricultural plant and work with the applicant to achieve his aims. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Thompson, you made specific references to some of our officers by name, and I only think it's fair that as they are present that they're entitled to come back. So I'll begin with Mr Inch. Andrew, would you like to come in on, on the comments that have been made about yourself? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, Chris will, Chris will be picking up any, any comments more generally, but you know, we have treated this as, as a new application and we very much explained to North Yorkshire um, Highway Authority the nature of the application. That was a matter for them, having had that explained to them, whether or not they then chose to um, raise any objection to the application, which in this particular case they, they didn't. Um, I'll let Chris pick up any other issues, Chair, if that's OK. Thank you, Andrew. Chris, you'd like to come in? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just to reiterate, any, any planning application is a new application. Um, and just as Andrew said, we Despite that being always the case, we did reiterate to consultees both over the board and internally at, at several opportunities and asked them to reconsider their comments after they'd even been made aware of that. So there is there's no question that they were aware this was a new application throughout um, and no suggestion that we've misled consultees throughout. Um, one thing I wanted to come back on was the, the photographs that have been provided. And although the, the object didn't, didn't refer to them, I just want to clarify those those viewpoints. Um, so you bear with me one moment. So we've had two photographs being presented um, and these have been included in uh, objections on, on our portal page as well. One from Ovington Lane and one from St Lawrence's Chapel. Um, and to us the photographs didn't appear to be a, a true representation of the site from these locations. The viewpoint from Ovington Lane is, is 500 metres to the west and the viewpoint from St Lawrence's Chapel is uh, a kilometre and a half to the east and it's almost a mile away. Um, for the the site to be clearly visible at these distances, it's assumed to capture these images. And telephoto lenses introduce a perspective distortion when the foreground features are, are in the shot and it compresses the real distance. Uh, we've taken photographs from the same viewpoints to compare the views shown by, by the objectors. Um, the first one from Ovington Lane. Um, so this is the viewpoint that's been submitted by the objectors. And then we've taken the same, same view 
Um, it's a slightly different angle, but you can you can barely see the site um, in the background. Now, in in reality, as a person being there, your viewpoint would actually be somewhere between the two based on the, the lenses used, but it certainly wouldn't be as clear as that from that viewpoint. Um, now the, the, the second view is from the scheduled ancient monument of St. Lawrence's Chapel at Barford. Um, so this is the, the picture we had submitted. Uh, and the, the one we've taken ourselves is, is here. And you, you really have to be looking for the site from the publicly accessible viewpoint, which is on this side of the fence. Um, the site can, can just be seen if you know it's there on the horizon. Um, and finally, the, the picture of the, of the trucks stacked at, at Winston Gate. Um, the, the picture submitted doesn't show any, any context of why they're there. Um, but this photograph from Ovington Lane shows building supplies being delivered to a building contractor at Winston Gate. Um, whilst it's likely this is a different occasion, it's possible explanation for why the trucks were held up in this location. So just a point of clarity on those. Um, in respect of the, the sustainability the aspect of the, the site and particularly the diesel, use of diesel generators. Obviously, this isn't, isn't optimal for climate change aspect, but it's not unusual for waste development um, to use processing plant that's mobile and diesel generated, even on industrial estates. In the case of the application site, the processing plant is actually electrically powered and, and fixed and could be powered with mains electric should a free phase connection become available or could also be driven by solar, battery storage, or other renewable or low carbon conditions being recommended to require the applicant to investigate this. And I understand the stability of permanent planning commission would provide the financial security to invest in low carbon alternatives. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris. And clearly we will come back to conditions if appropriate, because Councillor Bell has registered to speak on that. We now have two registered people supporting, uh, Kate, Miss, Miss Katie Wood and Mr Ian Bainbridge. I believe, Mr Bainbridge, are you speaking on behalf of you, not your, both of you? I am, yes. So, sir, you've got five minutes. We're over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, I would like to stress that Agricor is a, a diversified family-run business on a family-run farm owned since 1978. Uh, <coughs> sorry, Ms. Green. Uh, we look forward to running the farm and the recycling business for future generations. I would also stress that there is no intention to expand the business any further at this location. After 10 years of operating, we are no longer seeing a growth in plasterboard waste and consequently there is no reason to expand the facility at Hilltop or anywhere else. To give you some additional detail, we saw significant growth in waste up until about 2015, and this is the reason we constructed the, the existing facility. At the same time, we started to investigate quarry sites suitable for our expected continued expansion and relocation. We believe that this move would be financially supported and justified by the continued growth of the recycling business, which we had experienced up until 2015. Hilltop would no longer have been big enough if things continued to grow as they had, uh, and we outgrew the tonnages allowed within our planning and permits. In the end, no suitable quarries have come forward, and in reality, due to slowing in waste arisings, the expected further growth hasn't materialised, and we haven't outgrown Hilltop. We now process what is, we now process what is available within our regions, and we can continue to do this comfortably within our existing facilities. It is clear to us that the only option was to apply to remain at Hilltop. Through our operations to date, we have successfully worked with your officers and the Environment Agency in relation to all the concerns whenever they have arisen and to address any minor matters and to improve our procedures. I would point out that the majority of issues raised by objectors only came about after the planning application was submitted, not before. It has been demonstrated that the alleged issues when investigated have not been valid. In this context, and as confirmation of these findings, I will direct you to the officer's report and presentation which confirms that all of the statutory consultees, including the highways officers in County Durham and North Yorkshire, have no objections to the application. Agricor now employs 15 full time, <coughs> 15 people full time, sorry, 93% of which live within 10 miles of the, of the application site and in County Durham, as well as numerous others indirectly. These are skilled workers 
<coughs> sorry, these are skilled workers trained and competent in operating our plant, recycling what can be a challenging waste stream. This process has to be undertaken carefully to ensure our products, 99% of which are diverted from landfill, are quality compliant. Our employees' key focus is job security in these uncertain times, and we have backed them fully when, in some cases, their job start dates meant they fell between the gaps in furlough support in early 2020. Excuse me. This facility is one of only a handful of specialist plasterboard recycling plants in the country. It ensures that waste is dealt with in a sustainable manner and in accordance with the waste hierarchy. Agricor is located in a rural area, not an industrial estate. It has been success successful because it is located close to the users of the gypsum rather than the producers of the waste. So why here? The reason for this is the gypsum output is an excellent soil improver for local farmers. Much of County Durham and North Yorkshire is based on a magnesium limestone escarpment, which benefits greatly from gypsum as a fertilizer. Hence, 80% of the gypsum is used by farmers within 15 miles of the site. The site is close to the users of the recyclate rather than the producers of the waste. It is therefore sustainable in transport terms. This has been backed by firm words of support from over 100 of our 300 strong farm customer base, as well as support from 60 local residents, waste companies and subcontractors. As we've already said, the waste itself comes from all around the North and Scotland, and we are the northernmost recycler in the UK. Therefore, the question of what is local is difficult to define. You have a minute left. Thank you. What is important is the fact that Agricor is located on a freight route connected to trunk roads. This is the most sustainable option. To summarise, this business has been 10 years in the making and has become a small but important part of this country's need to have a full, fully circular economy, zero waste to landfill, with all waste reused or recovered and as little exported as possible. This approach is completely consistent within a move to a more sustainable future and as a green recycling operation is entirely consistent with government policy. I urge you to protect these quality jobs that have been sustained through this crisis and those services we offer to hundreds of farmers and waste businesses in the region and beyond. We would be grateful for your full support. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Bainbridge. Chris, do you wish to come ahead or can I go straight into members? Uh, no, nothing now, Chairman. OK, so can I thank Councillor Cook, Councillor Rawlinson, Mrs Nichols, Councillor Thompson, yourself, Mr Bainbridge and Katie Wood for joining us this morning. Uh, and now move over to members. Um, I've got one member that obviously registered earlier on to speak, Councillor Alan Bell. Alan, would you like to come in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it was just for clarification on the condition, um, on the conditions which the the chap from James from the parish con council referred to about the con conditions being sort of um, not being met in in the temporary period. And I was just curious also after further discussion in, in relation to was this also involved the highway movements on that thank you mr chairman thank you alan chris would you like to go have we got anybody from highways here uh yes dave stewart's from highways here but sorry i'll, um, I'll look at just a bit a bit slow get to the microphone there yeah dave stewart from i'm from the highways development management side so, Chris, if you go first on your side, and then Dave, would you mind uh, answering any questions on highways? I'd be grateful. Chris? Sure. Okay, Chris, so the, the, um, the issues raised in terms of conditions weren't specific, so I'll, I'll look at the, the conditions in general of the 2015 permission. Um, the, the first condition was that the development was approved for, for five years for the use of the, the buildings for plasterboard recycling. Now that expired in, in November last year, but the application to regularise and make it permanent was submitted uh, or, or validated in, in January last year. So they, they got that in ahead of time. Um, and you know there was potential that could have been determined before their existing permission ran out. Um, in terms of the, the approval, as I've already set out, there, there were some discrepancies within that. The building is very slightly wider and slightly further to the east than, than was approved. Um, the reason for doing that was so that uh, trucks could turn in the yard. Um, 
and also to reduce the roof angle so that it matched the existing buildings on the site. Really, the, the applicant should have regularised that at the time, um, but the, the building is materially very similar to what was approved. Um, we did uh, request that the building work was undertaken within eight months of the permission being granted. Um, and it did take longer than that, but as the, the applicant has set out, they did spend some time investigating alternative sites before investing at Hilltop Farm. And that's what delayed the process. However, the purpose of that condition was to, to keep the, the dust emissions, et cetera, under control. And in that time, we didn't receive any significant issues with the operation of the site. So the, the, the breach of that condition wasn't considered um, necessary to take enforcement action against. Um, looking at other conditions, uh, we've had complaints that plasterboard's been delivered before the operating hours of um, seven o'clock in the morning. Um, what was happening was trucks were arriving slightly too early and stacking on the weigh bridge. To counter that, the applicants put a gate on the site to prevent them accessing the site before that time. Um, there has been times where the total number of vehicles transporting plasterboard and gypsum from the site has exceeded the the, mac, the daily maximum of 40 of 20 in 20 out. Now, the applicant has put in this application to increase that, that daily limit to a maximum of 60 per day, 30 and 30 out, but retaining the weekly average of 240, which was the, the, the six days operating and, and 40 movements. Um, so again, they, they've made the efforts there to regularise that. However, we've never actually received a complaint about uh, there being too many vehicle movements until the objectors actually stood at the gate and did a traffic survey to count the number of vehicles. And that, that was um, in the, the middle of last year that, that uh, occurred. Uh, so that's it, Jim. I think that we're OK about that. Thank you very much, Chris. Dave, would you like to come in on the highways issue, please? Um, yeah, great, happy to. The, um, as Chris pointed out, the uh, the weekly f the weekly amount of movements is proposed to be unchanged, albeit it's proposed that they're going to be uh, can be high, higher during particular days, if and when uh, the needs arise in terms of the operation of the the business. That's been made clear all along in terms of the transport statement, and it's been made clear to North Yorkshire. Um, in actual fact, the application, whilst it is a new application in practical terms, we do have experience, obviously, of a number of years of site operation before COVID. Um, and we've also, both North Yorkshire and uh, Durham, have contacted highway maintenance respective colleagues in terms of their experience of the maintenance of the site since Agricor took, took place. Uh, and in general terms, they find it not unique uh, in terms of verge condition uh, and in terms of maintenance requirements. They don't regard it as being exceptional or anything being uh, directly attributable to, to Agricor. Um, the B road, the B6274 is obviously a classified road. It's a B road. It's part of the county road network that HG, HGV drivers are expected to use to access destinations within the county. Um, the actual flows on the road are, uh, in objective terms, very light in, in relative terms as well. Uh, even with the addition of Agricor's traffic, it's estimated that the, at the site entrance it would be between 800 and uh, 1,000 two-way movements a day, which in general terms and in comparison with other classified roads is a, is a, a low flow. Um, just to put that in perspective, the same B6274 runs north from Winston to Staindrop, and that is a slightly lower, big upon a slightly, a slightly higher um, two-way flow. It is also subject in places to tight horizontal alignment. But and again, that is also part of the the classified road network that, in practice, um, Durham has to work with, and which we direct traffic to, strategic traffic to, and in preference to other less appropriate routes. Thanks, Jen. 
Thank you very much, David. OK, I've got a number of members wishing to speak, but I've also got the, the solicitor to the committee. So what I propose to do is take Neil first, then George Richardson, the other local member, and then the three councillors, Alan Councillor Shield, Councillor Fraser Tinsley and Councillor Mark Wilkes. But first of all, can we go to Neil? You would like to come in, Neil? Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, it was it was just a, a word of caution, really, um, on the the existing permission and the the conditions and enforcement matters. So we, you know, we've heard um, already um, from various parties a, a, about the the um, the issues surrounding that. But I, I just want to remind members that um, the application to be determined is the the one that's in front of you today, um, and just sort of caution against getting too hung up on. What is the the scope of the existing permission conditions breaches etc? Clearly, any enforcement matters are outside of the, the the remit of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Neil. So we go to yourself, George Councillor Richardson, as the other local member. George, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to be sure that we are in the debate now and and not uh, prior to it. We are definitely in the debate, sir. Yeah. Right, thank you. This has been ongoing for a long, long time. The people of Winston in particular have had to suffer great discomfort and distress with, with vehicles in particular. I've got several things to say. Uh, first off, and I'll try and phrase it delicately because I've been a little bit surprised at how the officer has defended his presentation. Years ago, uh, and I've been at the county since its uh, unitary inception, I went to in a meeting with uh, Stuart Timmis to say that officers should present their presentation and leave it at that. And he agreed with me. And ever since that, that's what's happened. I do feel the, the officer has defended his, his uh, presentation more than he should have done. However, I'll leave that for further and I hope I haven't overstepped the, the mark in, in saying that. Is this a place for a sustainable building? Well, the local people and of all the surrounding area, North Yorkshire included, would beg to differ. Yes, maybe not, not in North Yorkshire County Council, but I know several people over the Caldwell area and, and they do concur with what's been said, that uh, their roads and roadsides and roadside verges and, and the like are being destroyed. Can't be a lady walk with a pushchair, anybody on a bike or anybody on a horse safely anymore around these areas. That's the main crux of the debate for having this waste site moved to a more sustainable uh, place. The uh, other point is, is the letters of support. Now then, I'm a farmer, as you all know, at the county. And to get a farmer to send a letter of support to anything would be practically non-existent. So I would I'd just let, put it out there that uh, none of these letters are signed and how many of the uh, supposed letters of support are actually letters, for, do the people even know that they've sent been sent in their name? The uh, also is, which I, I did have corroborated a few years ago, Mr Ian Bainbridge says, as the applicant says, that this is a family run business. And yet uh, I think company ha company's house would beg to differ. It was sold as far as I know. And I'm not going to stand up and say that's perfectly true, but I, I, uh, I would invite anybody to come back and, and defend that as being wrong. The uh, policy 31 has it that there should be no unacceptable impact into the area, to the countryside. Well, I think that it does do that. 
by no means. And also policy 39 says that there should be no unacceptable harm to the countryside. So this has been, you, you're just hearing about it now, maybe for the first time, or although maybe a, a, an odd email or two in the past recently, but we've, this has been ongoing for years. The parish council, as councillor James Cook suggested, accepted, will go for temporary five years permission and then it would be ended. Well, this hasn't happened. This isn't going to happen. And for to impose on the local area all of this hazard and, and particularly road roadworks is is not acceptable. So I'm going to propose that we refuse this application, Mr. Chairman, on the grounds that it doesn't fit in with policy thirty one or policy thirty nine. Thank you. I think I've got what said what I wanted. Thank you, George. So now we move into the three that I've, I spoke. So we'll take Councillor Shield, then Councillor Tinsley, um, then we'll so it'll be Councillor Shields, Councillor Tinsley, and then Councillor Wilkes, and then we'll, if need be, bring in an officer in any con any response. Okay, Councillor Shields, Alan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm greatly troubled by this application, um, concerning that there are no statutory objections and yet there is some clear um whether we call them breaches of policy or policies which don't strictly comply to the letter of the law i've read very carefully the report i've listened very carefully to the officers and also to the objections and i think there is some merit um and i think we need to take cognizance of that Part eight of the NPPF starts about promoting in the health, healthy and safe communities. Part nine talks about promoting sustainable transport. Part 15 talks about conserving, enhancing the natural environment. All of those have to be questioned. If we go to the County Durham plan, policy 10 talks about developing the countryside. And as this is a new application, it should be considered as such. Policy 29 talks about sustainability and design. And policy 31, as mentioned by George Richardson, talks about immunity and pollution. But also, I'd like to raise the point about policy 31. And I want to read this out verbatim, which is environmental impact of road traffic states that waste development will only be permitted if traffic estimated to be generated by the development can be accommodated safely on the highway network, the immunity of roadside communities is protected. The strategic highway network can be safely and conveniently accessed and the impact of traffic generated by development on local and recreational immunity is otherwise acceptable. Now, given that we have an issue where 50% of the roads of this particular road, the B6274, there's no particular way that vehicles can equally pass each other would seem to contradict what we've heard from the officers in comparison to policy 31. So I have some serious concerns. Uh, nobody wants to lose jobs. That's quite clear. Uh, and I think there is a need for perhaps a wider look at where a similar facility can be set up because it's not sustainable in my view. And I'm minded at the moment to second Councillor Richardson's uh, proposal to refuse it, but I will listen to the rest of the discussions before making that as a final judgment, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So, Chris, Joe, David, there's quite references to policies there that when we come back, clearly you will need to refer to. Councillor Tinsley, Fraser. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, this is a very uh, clearly a contentious planning application. I think we're we are at the sharp end of, of, of planning here. Um, I think there's something that is very important and different to a lot of the applications we often get in this committee. Uh, we do have the benefit of actually seeing how this operation works because it has been trading and operating for a period of time in a similar way to what would occur if permission were to be granted today. 
So that enables the community to look at what uh, the impacts are in reality, rather than just conjecture, which is often the position we are in in planning when we try to project and forecast what the impact of a development is going to be. Um, I think, uh, I think obviously in, in a beautiful rural location um, such as this, um, it's not a, a typical form of development that one would normally associate with such, such an area. It is a, a quasi, it is an industrial uh, type use that's occurring there. Um, but there is the benefit, of course, that, that that is employment generating, which we understand and we know is very important in our, our rural areas uh, across County Durham and indeed beyond. But I think um, what is important is when that we, we, we look at uh, the fact that this has operated in a similar way to how it would operate uh, moving forward. Um, the, there, are, there are two things that do stand out to me, and I, I see that the, the level of objection from the local community, and as I've said, that's understandable. But there is a difficulty in that I've looked through the report, I've, I've looked uh, at, at the evidence before us, and, and the Environment Agency, for one, have raised no objections to this, and I don't see any evidence of any significant breaches of the licenses that have been issued by them. And particularly important to me is uh, I, I take the, the issue around highways and HGVs very significantly, but there's, there's no objection from, from the highway authority, highway authority, not just in Durham, but also North Yorkshire County Council. And uh, that is a concern that there isn't the, the statutory and non-statutory objections from consultees that would confirm that local objection, which is entirely understandable in these circumstances. So uh, I will listen to the rest of the debate, uh, Chair, uh, but it is a, it's a very difficult uh, application to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fraser. Mark, Councillor Tinsley. Sorry, Councillor Tinsley. Mark, Councillor Wilkes. Sorry, Chair. Um, Fraser was unusually short, uh, so you caught me out there. <laughs> um, I'd like, if possible, to ask the, um, the highways officer a couple of questions. Um, from what I can gather, the vast majority of the HGVs um, are accessing this site via the A667 and over Winston Bridge. Um, and I'd just like to clarify, I believe that to be the case. There are a small number that it would be suggested would go through other villages where there are weight limits. I know this area quite well from many years ago when I stood for Parliament, and I know that bridge very well. And it was built in 1760 something um, for transporting coal. Um, but what was transported back then didn't weigh 40 tonnes for each vehicle that was going across, I would imagine. Um, we've seen what happened at Halton Bridge. We've seen what's happened in other parts of the county with bridges where they get damaged because of um, significant use. If this bridge was to be put out of action, the, the, impl the implications for the community around, for tourism and for residents, it would be an absolute disaster. Um, I'd like to know from the highways officer how we can be certain that a 250-year-old bridge, which was never built for 40-ton vehicles, can safely accept this many vehicles? And what actually would the implications be if we have to close this bridge, not just uh, in terms of residential amenity, business, tourism, but also the cost to repair it? Because we've got a massive backlog of uh, re repair uh, costs in County Durham for bridges. We don't get sufficient money from the government towards it um, to, to deal with this. And I don't want, as a county, for us to end up with such a significant bill on our hands. Um, and then the secondary thing is, it's so close to the A1 to the A67. There, there's so many farms and possible locations along this A67, the A66. Um, that is it really necessary for this to be located at this location, which is only a mile or so away from a main road? Why force? Why force these HGVs to have to travel through a small village over a, a 250-year-old bridge? And potentially, if something happens on that bridge, to force these HGVs to then have to travel through the countryside down tiny country lanes. I, I feel as though, yes, we need to recycle. Yes, 
farmers in this area can use this material and probably more material if there was more available but it, it it has to be done in the right way in the right location and at the moment i do i do feel as councillor shield has commented about policy 31 um as to whether this is the right location and i'm specifically concerned about highway safety and the risk and damage to the public highway as well as the residential amenity problems thank you chair thank you mark so david can we come straight to you because a lot of the conversation from then members was around highways and policy 31 and then we'll go to chris on the specific policies from planning david thanks chair um the issue of winston bridge is is within your report it's uh we've contacted colleagues in terms of maintaining bridge infrastructure and made explicit what the application is uh, and I think as it's summarised in your report, they've got full confidence that the uh, that the structure of the bridge is fully compliant in terms of loading and all potential loadings. Um, and there are no issues in that respect. In terms of concern about what would happen if the bridge were struck, um, I think ultimately going to the conclusion, the, the logical conclusion of that argument is that that aspect is possible with any, with any form of traffic that passes over the bridge. I appreciate that might be that is potentially a greater uh, risk with additional traffic, but that in itself would not, in my view, be a basis to to refuse the application. Excuse me, refuse the application. Um, also, in terms of bridges, I don't know exactly because uh, it's not within my area. But I would imagine North Yorkshire has at least some bridges on that route. Uh, they'll be aware of the situation, um, and they themselves have uh, not made any representations in terms of bridge structure and any need for strengthening. Uh, in relation to Councillor Shields' comments about, um, uh, I think he'd heard that quote, 50% of the road is not of sufficient width. Uh, I think it needs to be borne, borne in mind that that figure is based on uh, objectors assessment and taking reference points from the internet in terms of what is an appropriate width of highway, um, making reference to when a new rural road is uh, constructed. But of course, we've not on the basis of a new rural road being constructed. We're talking about an existing road that has been there for very many decades, um, long before the amount of car usage that we've got now. But in practice, it is very similar in terms of its uh, alignment, its, um, its highway verges, uh, and its construction in terms of its ability to accommodate uh, strategic traffic and in that respect it performs its function relatively well. I think the, the relevant matter in this application is the difference that the, the site uh, generated traffic makes to the operation of the existing B road because as we know the B road already serves uh, agricultural land, other businesses, there is no restriction in terms of through movement between the A66 and A67 and indeed it's signed as such from either end. Um, so the the amount of traffic is being the amount of traffic that emanates from the junction will in practice split. Uh, now I know objectors have made a uh, done a survey in terms of the respective uh, split, and whilst I think it was one for one day only, it did represent basically very close to fifty percent split either direction. Um, now, nobody has contested that, the, the applicant's transport consultant hasn't tested that, but the, the point I'm making is that the amount of generated traffic from the Agricor site uh, does not all go upon one link, it will always be split to some extent. Now whether that's 40, 60 in one direction or vice versa or 50, obviously that will change from day to day, but uh, the amount of traffic that's, that, that is permitted currently uh, does not all go up along the same the same link to one direction, either fully all to the 67, A67, or fully all to the A66. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Dave. Mark, if you go into the report, page 66, and then going on to slightly under 67, paragraphs 219 to 225, there's reference there under the heritage section on Winston Bridge. It does talk about being referred to elsewhere in the report, which certainly uh, that was the main part that I found but I will keep on looking at as Chris Shields responds to try and find somewhere else for you, Mark. Chris, would you like to come back on the policies that have been referred to? 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I don't want to labour the point or overly defend my, my report here, as, as has been suggested, so I'm just going to try and keep it as factual as possible. Uh, in relation to policy 31 on amenity, we've fully assessed the report. We've gone to, I mean, we, we always go to the full um, assessment on any application, but in this case, we, we've gone to um, the far end um, and we've had noise assessments done of the site and the road and they've both come out as a, a negligible impact. Now, whilst um, that, that's the factual case, it's accepted in the report, the residents might have a, a different opinion and their perception of the impact might be greater, even though the, the real impact is less and you need to bear that in mind when uh, determining the application. Um, as has been identified, this, this is technically development in the countryside um, and policy 10 would appear to be the relevant policy, but that policy also states that um, where the development is allowed by other policies within the plan, then they should be the ones that, that determine it. So that in this case, policy 10 isn't the determining policy. You should be looking to policy 61 um, for new waste development as your determining policy. Now that obviously takes into, a, into consideration other environmental policies, including 31 and 29. Uh, and 21 in, in respective highways. Um, in terms of the bridge strength, we, we, we shouldn't be um, determining planning applications on the risk that something will go wrong. So whilst I understand Council Wilkes's point in, in that respect, we should assume that developments will uh, operate correctly and therefore not crash, uh, HGV should not be crashing into bridges. Um, notwithstanding that, the bridge has been um, assessed by our bridges team uh, has been um, acceptable. It had some work done a few years ago. Um, and in fact, two two sessions of work and uh, the deck is is strong enough to take the traffic that's going over it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chris. I, I know, Mark, you want to come back, but if you don't mind, Council Mr. Clare has been waiting since 20 past 10, uh, silently waiting there. So I'll take the, the three above you, then we'll come back, Mark. I've got Councillor Clare, Councillor Atkinson and Councillor yeah. Kay. John, would you like to come in first, sir? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it, um, that um, on this committee, we very often um, disagree with officers and sometimes we question officers. Um, I'm, I would like to commend um, Councillor Richardson on the way he addressed an issue whether he was questioning the officers, but we never, attack the officers or question their probity and that just uh, is counterproductive it just gets people's backs up um sort of um the, sort of so um I, I feel a need that we defend our officers uh, from um uh, accusation um what i will do is however i do have a question for them <laughs> um I'd like to ask, uh, bring up um, condition seven, please. I've, Chair, I have a question, and then I'll, I'm going to make a statement. Um, and what question, uh, what condition seven does is that it says within six months of the date of this planning permission, a report detailing an investigation of sustainable power generation for the site with a timetable for implementation of the identifi identified technology shall be submitted to the local planning authority for approval in writing. I have two questions about that. Um, the first is that it, it's sort of, it's, it, I would like clarity on what it's actually requiring because part of it seems to be requiring a report, but then it goes on to seem to require that, um, uh, that a sustainable power generation uh, be um, identified and implemented. So my first question, Chair, uh, to the officers is, is, uh, is how tight is this on the requirement for a, um, a sustainable power generation source? And the second question I've got is, is that, and I think I know the answer to this because I've asked a similar question about a similar condition, it says shall be submitted to the local planning authority. And, and, and my second question is, is that if somebody chose to call that in, could we then uh, reassemble or could we reassemble the, the county planning committee to look at that um, uh, sort of report um, uh, for approval? 
or will this be entirely done under delegated powers um, by the um, officers? I understand, as I understand it, we could call that uh, in when it comes back in six months' time. Um, so, so those are my two questions. Uh, if I can wait for the answers, and then I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a while, Chair, if it's all right, please. Chris, would you like to answer Councillor Clare? Uh, yes, that, that's fine. Um, so that, that condition has been applied to address the sustainability issues that have been raised in respect of the, the sites, uh, relying on, on diesel generators for, for power because they, they don't have um, the, the three-phase three connection at the moment. Um, we agreed this condition with, with the applicant because we're aware they're already considering alternative power sources for the site because running on diesel generators is, is extremely expensive. But what is also extremely expensive is an alternative power source. And if they don't have permanent planning permission, um, that would be a, a redundant uh, expenditure. So subject to them getting permanent planning permission, it, it makes that uh, easier to, to finance. Um, in terms of how strong that, that condition is, well, we think it works. It does require them to investigate alternative means of powering the site. But what what might come out of that is that the, the technology they identify, should it be solar, wind, battery storage, might need planning permission in itself. So it could be that they identify uh, a power source, which we then need another application for. And that in itself could be found to be unacceptable or acceptable. But the, the outcome of that condition might be that they can't deliver it or they can deliver it to a lesser extent. Um, now, it, some forms of generation, such as a battery, would be mobile, like a diesel generator is, and doesn't actually require plan commission in itself. And this just gives us some confidence that they would actually deliver it and give us a timetable for doing that. Uh, in, in terms of being able to call it in, and if, if I'm wrong on this, I'll, I'll invite Neil to come back, but I believe you can call that in for the, the committee to look at. Thank you, Chris. OK, so we'll go back to Councillor Clare for his comments, which I no doubt he will give. And then we'll go to Councillor Mr Atkinson, Jim, and then Councillor Mr K. So we'll go straight to John and then Jim. John. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I'm going to comment on the diesel generators aspect of it. Um, uh, I've been sent a number of letters <coughs> which have been deeply welcomed uh, by people sort of saying, you're the climate change champion. Um, what do you reckon to this? Um, and um, uh, the, um, I would point out that I've also been challenged um, on the report given by the low carbon team, which addressed this very issue. Um, I think I would stand with the low carbon team about the fact um, that uh, these things are not illegal yet. Um, they are used in many uh, farms, but also in rural businesses. And we mustn't um, underestimate the um, importance and number of rural businesses. Um, the, the alternative to this is not a farm. Um, I would say that um, agriculture have a moral obligation. Um, and I would say that in um, planning terms, this is a dint on their um, uh, claim to be sustainable. But um, as we all know, um, it is just one thing upon a, a whole range of things uh, which are to do with the sustainability of this. Um, uh, one of the issues which we have to take into account if we're just looking at it from a climate change point of view only is that this is a recycling plant. It is uh, recycling gypsum and therefore um, obviating one landfill and two, the need to mine more gypsum. Um, it um, and also we have to think about um, the fact that what would happen if we were to refuse permission um, if uh, sort of this this um, barn would still be used and it would actually probably still use the same diesel generators and, and if it housed uh, a process such as pig farming um, which I saw mentioned in the report as a, a one time use uh, on the farm um, in fact in terms of climate uh, in uh, sort of CO2 emissions and methane emissions, that would be much, much worse than this recycling plant. Um, therefore, I do not see 
um, the fact that there are diesel generators, while regrettable in the extreme, I do not see that that in itself is a reason to refuse um, uh, planning permission for this. And uh, as the uh, low carbon team uh, suggested, it is much more appropriate to condition this. And therefore, that's why I welcome condition seven. That's why I questioned its um, uh, tightness, its force. Um, and I would um, uh, sort of urge uh, Agricor to get this uh, sorted out as soon as possible and then to return to us, because I would certainly want to uh, question them on what they're doing. Um, just on the um, application in general, um, can I just say that I find this one of those um, uh, things which is just impossible to get right. There is just no doubt that um, this is has deep hostility within the community who see it as um, and, and, and I note Councillor Richardson who spoke so wisely um, sort of um, in the words unacceptable harm and there's just no doubt about it that the, the local community regard what this company does as unacceptable harm. Um, on the other hand the strength of this application in terms of jobs and the local economy and the uh, fact that 80% of the 80% which is used on farms is used within 15 miles and sort of whilst it is absolutely proven that sort of the, the uh, supply to this uh, comes from all over the country. It is absolutely undeniable that sort of the, um, the, the market is actually very local indeed. I was disappointed, Agricor, with your um, site assessment where you looked at alternatives. Uh, I thought that was shallow, um, but I thought that the, the issue of the locality of your market is a very powerful argument. Um, the traffic one again is just absolutely insoluble. Um, the, it is clearly a very narrow lane and everything you say about not being able to walk along it or um, ride a, a horse along it is absolutely spot on. And yet we're faced with the fact that highways have found no problem with it. And it is a B road. It's, it, it, it's designed nationally. To be to be used for for this kind of traffic, and so we find ourselves in this dreadful situation of of of, of what to decide, and that is true of every councillor, however they vote. Um, and just to con uh, continue uh, and fin and conclude, chair, um, I'm reminded of those football matches uh, where um, it's claimed that there's a vo a, a goal. And, and, and what we do is we sort of we have what's called VAR now and, and we have a, a look at a, a photograph and it shows the ball and, and sort of did it get over the line? It doesn't need to have gone screaming into the back of the net uh, in, in a most wonderful uh, display of talent. As long as it crawls over that line, then it's a goal. And I would remind everybody um, sort of objectors and supporters and, and councillors, however they're going to vote, because this is impossible to vote on. But it, this application does not need to tick every box and be the most wonderful thing you've ever had. All it needs is we need to ask ourselves, does this get over the line of acceptability? Um, and um, we'll, uh, sort of, I will wait till other people have spoke until I declare uh, how um, I'm going to vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, John. Councillor Atkinson, Jim, and then Councillor Keir, yeah. Jim. Yes, Chair. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Atkinson, Councillor Jim Atkinson from Eakley Feast. I'll be uh, voting in favour of the officer's recommendation on this application. I try to do what I always try to do when I come to a, a plan meeting, and I don't want to spread my wings too far. I, I just try and understand what's in front of me in the application and not, uh, on whose behalf uh, who's made the application and as it stands in front of me. 
This is an application uh, about the site. It's not about the, there's a better site somewhere else. We can't see sites anywhere else or anything like that. It's about this site uh, that already exists in its place and it's just looking to move forward. Uh, it, it did have a, a temporary um, permission to do what it's doing, but now it's looking to further that on. Uh, it seems, as somebody suggested earlier on that, uh, this temporary was temporary and permanently temporary as if we can't move on in the future and no planning uh, committee is able to make remarks relative to, to moving things forward in the future. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be voting in favour. I, I was a little, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed in a few things I've heard this morning, especially, and John's alluded to them already, some of the well, to a certain extent, uh, um, accusations, if you like. It, it appears that any letters of um, in favour uh, uh, um, possibly bogus, is that the right word to use? Uh, uh, you know, um, we don't know who they are, but, uh, but the, the officers have been asked and answered the questions on that one. Um, I, I just accept everything that I see in front of me uh, as acceptable. It, it, it's as simple as that. So there are people in favour of it. Now I'm disappointed that it, there will be suggestions that it, it's come from here, there and everywhere. I was, I was a little bit disappointed in what Councillor Thompson said from North Yorkshire. He, he actually used the term misled them. Uh, and then the officer tells us they had all the information they required and they still didn't put any objections in. So that was an interesting comment. Councillor Rawlinson came in earlier on and he, and, and he mentioned that I think last time an application for me was in favour of it. Seemed to have some kind of altercation with somebody that intimated they might not vote for him and changed his mind. At least, you know, it's a long time since he said it, so I, I'll apologise if I got that wrong, but that's what it sounded like to me. Uh, so, as I say, as the application stands in front of me. I, I, I haven't seen that the objections outweigh the um, benefits and, and uh, from that position, I'll be voting in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Ackerton. Can I make it clear that accusations, comments, politics, etc., we're not basing our decision on that, we're basing our decision upon the policies, the report, etc., in front of us and on, on what members have said. But I know I know what you're saying, Councillor Atkinson, uh, but we are making it on exactly what's in front of us. Councillor Cade, Charlie? Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, Councillor Charlie Kerr, Cowden Division. Um, we've had a long and fulsome debate this morning, and I'm not going to simply reiterate what has already been said. Um, some interesting contributions from my fellow councillors, particularly councillors Richardson and Clare. Hopefully I'm a little less contentious. Like Councillor Wilkes, I know this area very well, but uh, not from the lofty guise of a a parliamentary candidate, but from the rather less um, guise of being a leisure cyclist. And I know this area very well. Ovingham, Hutton Magna, Winston, Winston Gate, the whole area. We could go on small ways, but you don't need me to repeat every village that's along and beside the B6274. Uh, as a cyclist who uses this route, it's a primary route for cyclists from the Bishop Auckland area and other areas for that matter to get to Richmond and beyond. So we use this route regularly, not just on a weekend, regularly. And I have to say, I've yet to be riding my bicycle along that road and thought, dear me, these HGVs are terrible. They're passing me one after another. Or look at that spoiled hedgerow. Look at that knocked over sign. I'm sorry, as somebody who uses the road regularly at a slow speed, not as fast as I used to be, I'm 57 year old, but still uses the road. I have to say, I've had it in, in the 1980s, if you used the A689 when uh, Eastgate was on the go, the cement plant, lordy, lordy, the amount of HGVs that passed you there was terrifying, but I don't get it on this road. So I do not buy the argument that this road, the B6274, is unsuitable for the current use, because the evidence that I've seen in real terms doesn't stack up. I do have concern, uh, I have to say a niggle, that we've been told to treat every application as it's a new application, and yes, I completely buy into that. That said, this being a new, if this was a new application 
from pure greenfield site, would we be supporting it? I'm, I'm not so sure. Like others, I haven't completely made my mind up yet, but I have to say I am, as Councillor Claire, uh, Claire said, um, on balance, uh, I am leaning towards approval. Thank you, Chair. No, yeah. thank you, Councillor Kate. Um, Chris, David, I didn't pick anything up that in them comments that you needed to come back on. Uh, neither of yeah. you jumping forward to see you coming back. No, so the, only one I, the only one I've got left to speak, and then we'll go straight into the vote, uh, is Councillor Mr Wilkes, who I promised could come back on highways. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm still pondering on this as well, on balance, um, but I just want to be clear with the highways officer on the second point that I wanted to make, and that's just in terms of at what point does the cumulative impact of a facility um, make highways believe that something does go beyond the capacity or the ability of a particular road or a structure, or whatever it is, to, to actually cope? So I guess what I'd like to ask the highways officer is how many more vehicles would we have to see going to and from this site before you would say, sorry, that's too much? Because if, if we can say right now that highways is saying it isn't too much, what's the cutoff point? I think you must know the cutoff point. So could I ask what the cutoff point would be, please? David? Thanks, Chair. Um, that would be great if there was an actual figure that I could pluck out the air or anybody in my position could do because it would be, make my job extremely easy. Um, uh, I'm afraid it, it's all a question of uh, extent and degree and the alignment and the amount of traffic and the type of traffic. Um, and also, ultimately, it would have to be a, a convincing case that would have to be made to a planning inspector if it, was, if it came to an appeal. So um, I'm afraid I'm going to decline in terms of coming to uh, giving you a figure and saying 200, 300, 10, 15, um, because capacities in terms of uh, uh, capacities in terms of highways, there are capacities in terms of highways in terms of straight links of uniform width, um, but this is clearly not one uh, that is subject to that. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there was, there was a basis for asking the question in terms of perhaps limiting the by condition, saying no more than X. But um, I'm afraid there is no magic figure that I or any of my uh, colleagues or private uh, consultants will pick out the air and say 10 more and no more. Um, thanks, Chair. Audrey, you would like to come in? Along the bridge. <laughs> Yes, thanks, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to, the points that Councillor Tinsley made, I have to support, and I agree entirely with Councillor Clare that this application is very difficult. But with jobs and the local economy, I have to support the officer's recommendation on this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, ladies and gentlemen, I've got nobody else wishing to speak. At this moment in time, I have one proposal. George, can I come back to you? Because you wanted to propose. Could you say what your proposal was and which policies you're basing your refusal on? Yes, Mr Chairman. My proposal was for refusal using policy 31, which is not acceptable in the countryside, and uh, policy 39, which is unacceptable harm to the countryside. Thank you, George. Does Councillor Richardson have a second there? Yes, Chair, I'll be willing to support the um, local members' um, proposal to refuse this application. Thank you. Oh, OK, thank you. Can I now go to the solicitor and take some advice? Uh, Neil, Mr Carter, clearly, in my opinion, if, it'll, if, if it's like a straight for or against, or do you want me to take an amendment for accepting the officer's recommendation? Chair, I, I would agree with you. It's a, it's a straightforward um, for or against situation. Um, but be, before we get to that, um, I'd just like to, to probe um, further with, with Councillor Richardson, if I may, what, what the, the reasons exactly are that he's, that he's proposing for um, refusal. I mean, I understand the, the scope of the, the two policies that he's mentioned, but there's, there's actually quite a lot of ground covered by those policies. So I just wondered if he could be 
any more specific. I mean, for example, policy 31, um, is, it, is it purely um, about noise? Is it about disturbance? Um, is, is it about, um, you know, it, it talk, that policy talks about noise, vibration, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to try and drill down a, a bit further into to what it is that he's specifically concerned about. Um, and equally, if he could um, elaborate on um, what aspect of, of policy 39 that, he, that he's yeah. concerned about, that would be useful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Over to you, George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The policy 31 would be the dust and the noise impact. And uh, it follows on just about the same with policy 39 unacceptable harm and to the road networks, uh, which are right with uh, Dave Stewart saying it's perfectly fine, but uh, local people have to live with this and they wouldn't yep. agree. So I hope that's all right now. Neil, waiting for you, yep. Yeah, yeah if I could, I could just come back on that and I'm, I'm grateful to, um, to Councillor Richardson for, for that elaboration. I mean, just before it's put to the vote, to the vote, um, I think I'd, I do need to, to 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 give some advice on how sustainable those, those reasons are for refusal. Um, I mean, we've we've heard obviously a lot um, about impacts upon the the highway network um, from from objectors in particular, um, and we've we've had professional advice from the the, the, the highway officer as well. Um, I mean, it seems to me that um, a refusal reason based um, upon um, unacceptable highway impacts is unlikely to be sustainable on appeal. And, you know, I know um, the, the risk um, of adverse costs, et cetera, on appeal is only one factor um, to be taken into account and shouldn't be an overriding consideration um, for, for members of the planning committee, but it is it is something that I, I feel I have to, to bring to your attention because as things stand, we've got no um, no specialist um, or professional um, evidence um, upon which to, to base um, a refusal reason around highway safety impacts. Um, equally, in terms of dust and noise, um, my understanding is that the, the applicant has submitted um, technical evidence on those issues um, and they've been assessed by our environmental health team and found to be um, at an acceptable level. So again, I think um, we would struggle to sustain um, a reason for refusal based upon that, but clearly it's a, it's a decision for members now. Quite correct, Niall. We have a proposal in, thank you very much for that advice. We have a proposal in front of us by Councillor Richardson, seconded by Councillor Shale to refuse. Neil, we're now going to the voting system. Could you please advise, clearly undertake the voting procedure, but advise our guests, our visitors, how we vote in Durham on Zoom? Sorry, on team. Yes, thank you, Chair. So what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come to, to each member present and ask if they're for or against, or equally if they, they, they wish to, to, to abstain. Um, and this is this is in connection with the um, proposal um, against officers' recommendation to refuse the application on the, the, the grounds that have been advanced um, by Councillor Richardson. So um, I will start with, with Councillor Atkinson and ask if he's for or against that. Jim, unfortunately you're on mute. Jim, could you put your mic on? Sorry, Chair. Just to be perfectly clear, I'm against George's proposal. I'm in favour of the application. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'll, I'll ask Councillor Bell if he's for or against. Yes, thank you, Neil. Such a balanced and a difficult one. But the same, same as Jim, I'm against George's recommendation and for the officer's, officer's recommendation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Clare, are you for or against? I could not support refusal on the grounds advanced by Councillor Richardson. I'm therefore against his motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Corrigan, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Hawley, for or against? 
Paul. Thank you. Councillor Jewell, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Kay, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Ling, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Richardson, for or against? I'm for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Shield, are you for or against? For refusal. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Simpson, are you for or against? For for Councillor Richardson's proposal. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tinsley, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. Councillor Wilkes, for or against? I'm against the application for Councillor Richardson's proposal. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilson, are you for or against? I'm uh, against refusal. Okay. Chair, make that 11 against and four in favour. Okay, so the refusal has been turned down. Now, Neil, would you uh, would you advise that we go back to a vote on acceptance? Yeah, Chair, can I, again, can I just be clear um, who's moving and, and seconding that? Yeah. Can we have a proposal to I'll accept? Councillor Mr Atkinson, seconded by... Second that, Chairman. Thank you very much, Audrey Councillor Leng. So therefore, we've got a proposal and a seconder that we are approving. Can you go through the procedure, please, Neil? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, I'll I'll go to to each member and ask them if the four are against, and and equally, if when I come to the member, if they want to abstain, if you can just let me know if that's the case. Um, so this is a, a vote um, to um, on the motion to approve the application. Um, in accordance with the, the officer's recommendation um, and the conditions that are, that are set out in the officer's report. So again, I'll start with, with Councillor Atkinson and ask if he's for or against. I'm for. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Um, next, Councillor Bell. For. Thank you. Um, next, Councillor Clare. Uh, I am for the officer's recommendation together with the conditions attached. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Corrigan. For. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawley. Against. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jewell. For. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kay. For. Thank you. Councillor Lang. For the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Richardson. Against. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shield. Against. Thank you. Councillor Shuttleworth. For. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Against. Thank you. Councillor Tinsley. For officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Wilkes. Against. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Four. Thank you. Chair, I make that um, ten four and five against. Thank you very much. So therefore, on that particular item, approval has been given and I would suggest to Councillor Sheila, uh, to the officers, Chris, etc. Thank you very much for your time this morning, and also the comments I would take on board. The comments made by Councillor Mr. Clare in regards to possible calling of that condition, but that's up to individual members. Can I say thank you very much to the members of the public who've joined us for that particular item, and we now move on to at the second item. The second item this morning is a residential development of up to 100 units at the land to the north of Darlington Road, Barnard Castle. Can I welcome Barry Gilbert, who's going to present the uh, report. Good morning, Barry. Morning, Chair. Could you let me know if you could see the slides, please? 
I can see them. Yes, sir, we can. Yeah. Okay. So this this item, item 5B on the agenda, is for a residential development of up to 100 units. It's an outline planning application with all matters reserved apart from the access, and it's located to the north of Darlington Road in Barnard Castle. So this is the site location plan. You have the site outlined in red um, in the middle of the screen there. The A688 is to the north. Darlington Road runs to the south of the site where there are uh, bus stops located. There is a new Taylor Wimpy site um, which directly adjoins the, the, the proposed application site. Um, to the west with the, the build-up area of Barnard Castle further beyond about 800 metres to the west of the site. Um, the settlement of Staten Grove is just to the to the east of the picture there. So this is the aerial photograph showing the site in context and its relationship to the build-up area of Barnard Castle. Um, as mentioned, the shops, facilities, etc., um, and bus stops are close by to the site. They're approximately 800 metres to the west, um, where you can see the built up area of Barnard Castle on your aerial photograph. So, this is a, a shot of the site looking to the west. So, at the top of the, of the photograph there, uh, you can see a rectangular shape which directly adjoins the new Taylor Wimpy site. So that that rectangular shape is the application site for this particular application. Again, another aerial photograph. Um, to the left, you can see a long rectangular shape adjoining the, adjoining the Taylor Wimpy site just to the west. A um, small caravan park to the south of the site. The road which the access would come from runs to the south on the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's the Darlington Road A67. And to put it in some sort of perspective, at, at the bottom of the screen there is the application site. Um, you can see that it, it, it doesn't form any sort of coalescence with any other settlements, um, particularly with Staten Grove. So this is the indicative layout plan. The application is an outline form. It's for up to 100 units, um, 100 dwellings. The site access comes off the south of the site onto Darlington Road, the A67. You can see the landscaping around the perimeter of the site, a proposed Suds Pond to the north of the site, and the existing new Taylor Wimpy development just to the west. So in terms of consultations and representations, we've got an objection from Marwood Parish Council and from Staten and uh, Streetland Parish Council the, the reasons for their objection uh, are reflected in the public responses, which we'll come on to later in the in the slides. Internally, our design and conservation officers consider that the indicative layout plan is generally acceptable, although this will be reviewed further if planning permission is granted um, at the reserved matter stage. Ecology officers have no objections. There would actually be biodiversity net gains um, within the site. Um, subject to the conditions being attached and that would come in the form of additional landscape and things like bat boxes, the ecology contribution that the Suds Pond would achieve. Our landscape officers have no objections subject to the recommendations in the landscaping assessment. Education officers confirm that no additional spaces are required so no contributions are necessary in this instance. Our planning policy officers confirm that the scheme would be acceptable, although it's not an allocation under policy four um, of, of the County Durham plan, it is acceptable under policy six of the plan, which does allow for exceptions. 
the NHS do require a financial contribution towards the local GP surgery capacity. Moving on, in terms of letters from members of the public, there have been 403 letters received as a result of the consultation exercise. 252 of these have been letters of objection, with 161 letters of support. The main areas of concern include that the site isn't allocated in the County Durham plan. There are concerns about traffic and congestion, that there have been too many recent developments in the area, that there's a lack of infrastructure in terms of schools and NHS facilities, that the development would harm the character of the market town, there would be a loss of wildlife and there would be an impact on residential amenity. The letters of support state that development would lead to job creation, would result in net environmental and biodiversity gain, there would be sustainable rural bus services supported through generation of new housing in the area. There is a short supply of good quality housing in the area and there's a claim that schools aren't full and the doctor surgery has capacity to um, maintain the development. So in summary, um, the development is in a sustainable location with good access to local services and public transport. The conditions would ensure improved landscape setting in this part of Barnard Castle. Biodiversity gains would be secured through uh, mitigation and landscaping proposals. Financial contributions towards recreation, NHS capacity, highway improvements, 20% affordable housing on site. And although, as mentioned previously, the site isn't allocated under policy four, it is considered to meet the criteria of policy six, which states that development will be permitted, provided the accord with relevant development plan policies, they are in a sustainable location, it's not prejudicial to highway safety, and it does have good sustainable modes of public transport to services and facilities, which in this case, officers do consider that that's, that is the case. So while mindful of the objections, it, it isn't considered that these are sufficient to change the recommendation, which is a recommendation for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Barry. So we now move Thank into you. our guests, and can I welcome them and thank them for, for waiting so long? Um, can we begin with we, by stating that neither Marwood or Stainton and Streetland Parish Council have requested to speak, so we've got no Parish Council input. Um, can I go straight to the local member, Councillor Rowlandson, and then we'll go over to Richard, who has five minutes and a joining member. Jim, back to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, James, I called you Jim, it's James, sorry. <laughs> Jim will be fine. I've been called worse. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I am the uh, uh, the chair of the, uh, of the State and Streetland Parish Council, so I, uh, I, I speak on their behalf as well. Um, this is an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, Staten and Marwood look over this area, um, and I'd, uh, you've got to go on policy 39 for new development, and, and that's, uh, that states that uh, you know areas of uh, outstanding natural beauty have got to be uh, maintained. Um, I would uh, question the officer's uh, statement of the fact that it doesn't uh, come near to uh, state and grow. Uh, the initial one of the initial photographs uh, at the bottom right hand corner of where the, uh, uh, the the houses will come to is only a hundred meters, less than a hundred meters away from Gypsy Lane and state and grow. Uh, and if you put that uh, photograph back up uh, for members later on, uh, you'll you'll see that. Uh, and and this is an encroachment uh, into the uh, pushing Barnard Castle into a, uh, into another uh, community. Um, and and paragraph uh, 91 on the uh, on the uh, details. Um, states, and I'm not going to go through them, that uh, all the things that uh, uh, that uh, shouldn't be allowed, um, you know, on the uh, on this uh, on this site. Um, 
as you see on the, you have it back up the site location the bottom right hand corner um uh, staten grove is is 100 meters away from uh, you know from from that corner there's only a small field that takes you to gypsy lane um and uh, and i would uh, i would hope that uh, members would uh, take into account the historic nature of this area, uh, the problems that uh, would be associated with uh, the development and uh, and would refuse the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Orlinson. We move over now to Richard, Councillor Bell. Good morning, Richard. <coughs> morning, Chairman, and thank you for letting me um, speak this morning. Um, I'm the adjoining member, as you say, and this is just a mile or two from the, the ward boundary, which is why I've had um, I presume a lot of my constituents um, on to me about this and why I'm wanting to speak today. Um, first of all, I, I would endorse the objections of the parish council, um, I think on the highways grounds, that's to say the amount of traffic that this will generate at really what is already a, bit, a bottleneck junction at the top of town next to the uh, petrol station. And particularly, I would endorse the comments about the general overdevelopment of the town and the amount of new units that have been built in the last few years. I think four new housing estates and around 400 units if you look at Barnard Castle and start with collectively. And that overdevelopment of the town is leading to um, pressure um, on the local health services, the, the doctors, etc. Um, people are mystified by the NHS response that a one-off contribution of £45,000 is enough to uh, to address this, which would pay for a junior nurse's salary for a year or a very small extension indeed to the doctor's surgery. People are genuinely mystified by that and local services are, uh, are under pressure. Um, there is no shortage of housing for sale in Barnard Castle. The existing units up for sale on the, the Startforth Road uh, are going very slowly. And this is, uh, to me, just an example of, of, of urban sprawl um, for property development for its own sake. My main objections are, I think, I would like you to consider the policies very carefully. Um, the SHLA, the Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment, um, but in, in 2019, uh, which is pretty recent really, said the development on the site would comprise an incursion into attractive open countryside, area of high landscape value, beyond the established settlement edge, not well related to existing form with greater prominence and impact than development to the west. So that's paragraph 19. That's what the opinion was in the Schla. So we're told that, well, never mind the Schla, um, you can bring it forward under policy six. Well, when policy six was sort of explained to us councillors as part of the county Durham plan process by policy officers, policy six was explained to us as allowing uh, flexibility for relatively small sites that hadn't been identified in the Schla to come forward in the future. And no, one, no one's going to argue that you shouldn't have flexibility to consider sites um, that may not have arisen when you know the Schla work was being done. I do think it's a, a distortion of policy six to the point of breaking it to be then using policy six to bring in a major application site, 100 plus units, so major that it has to come before the county planning committee, never mind southwest planning, the county planning committee using policy six to actually um, discount that Schla uh, view, which was relatively recent and bring forward this application. So to me, that is, I have to say, a misuse of policy six. And I'd also like like members to consider in particularly um, policy 39, which says that landscape uh, proposals for new development uh, will be permitted um, where, only be permitted where it conserves and where appropriate enhances the special qualities of the landscape, unless the benefits of the development in that location clearly outweigh the harm, unless the benefits of that development in that location clearly outweigh the harm. That is the hurdle you have got to jump in policy 39. In my opinion, the benefits clearly do not remotely outweigh the harm. There is not the demand for this housing in the town. There is not the necessity for this housing in the town. The pressure on local services are significant. And I would therefore ask the committee to reject this application as being contrary to policy 39. And in my view, a very much a distortion of policy six as well. And we have to ask ourselves, um, committee, what is the point of the counter Durham plan? What is the point of, of having the Schla process 
if major sites like this are coming through as an exception. This is not a site for one or two houses in a village, which I believe policy six was designed for. This is a major application coming to the county planning committee. And to me, it is stretching our county drone plan policies beyond breaking point. And one would have to say a plan that was adopted last October and the Schla in 2019, um, frankly, what is the point of the plan if it's just going to be discounted in this way? Thank you very much, Chairman, for your indulgence. No, thank you, Councillor Bell. So, uh, Barry, you've got both Councillor Rawlinson and Councillor Bell asking you to comment on policy 39, the Schla, and clearly the forceful points made by Councillor Mr Bell in regards to, to policy six. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, just in terms of the policy six criteria, after I've um, addressed the other points, I might ask Thomas Bennett from Spatial Policy to, to, to cover that point. Um, the question asked about the NHS and local GP surgeries, we did directly consult with the NHS and, and their calculation um, stated that approximately £45,000 was required to offset the impact of this development and that would go towards the upgrading and uh, expansion of the local GP surgery. Um, the Schla doesn't consider specific sites, doesn't consider specific development proposals. It, it looks at developments in principle. And in this instance, we've consulted with landscape officers um, we've had a landscape visual impact assessment submitted and subject to the conditions and um, suggestions in that report, which, which have been conditioned, um, the landscape officers say that there won't be any additional harm in terms of this being a gateway to the entrance of the village. It would actually improve the settlement edge with the landscape proposals um, being conditioned that have been suggested by the, by the application. Um, if I can ask Tom Bennett to maybe comment on the policy six um, issues. Yes, thanks, Barry. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, committee. Thomas Bennett, uh, principal policy officer within the special policy team. Um, just in terms of policy six, so that is the um, development on unallocated sites policy within the county driven plan. And that will apply to any site which comes forward as an application which isn't allocated within the county drone plan or within the neighbourhood plan where they are in, are in existence. It can handle any application of any size and it is criteria D of the policy which I'll draw your particular attention to and that sets out an assessment to be undertaken that whether or not the, the development is appropriate in terms of its scale design, layout and location to the character, function, form and setting of the settlement. So Barry's gone on to apply that particular aspect of policy six in terms of his judgment that 100 dwellings is commensurate with the sort of function of, of Barnard Castle. So policy six, it's part of the freshly adopted plan and it's there to provide flexibility and to assess each application that comes forwards on its merits and there's there's a number of aspects and particular criteria which needs to be satisfactor satisfactorily addressed. Thank you Thomas. I think Barry you do refer to policy six in paragraph 147. Um, if we now move on to, thank you gentlemen, if we now move on to the objectives can I say good morning to Mr and Mrs Gordon Jubb and Mr Alan Colthard um, Mr. Jupp, Mr. Coulthard, I'm told that you are both aware that you have two and a half minutes each. And as yes. well as, so as for others, you will be given a warning when you've got 30 seconds left. So the order I've been told is, Mr. Jupp, you're going first. I was going to say, if, if, if I can open it, Alan Coulthard, yeah. You want to open it, okay, Mr. Coulthard, yeah. if Mr. Jupp's happy with that, I've got no problems. Good can morning, I just say uh, you know, I'm a born and Castle resident. I've been in the area 30 plus years and uh, worked at GSK for a long time. You know, Barnet Castle has built a strong brand image as a picturesque market town. So that brand image is that strong, it attracts the likes of Dominic Cummins and tourists from all over the area to visit the town. That brand image must be protected. You know, and what's happened in the past is 
the town's contours has been able to hide the urbanization that has occurred. This proposed development does not hide that urbanization. It removes part of that brand image. Once you start eroding that brand image, you lose the sustainability, you lose the tourism. It's an erosion of that brand image that's at risk here. You know, the proposed bank's development is actually a repetitive urbanization of a picturesque market town. In supporting the, the, the letters of, uh, of support, there's a, they were fraudulent. I cannot believe that that wasn't presented. They, they were a cut and paste, 50 of them plus, I believe, from banks' employees in support of an application by the company. That's a fraudulent activity. That needs investigation. GSK is the main employer of the town is reducing its workforce. It's going automation. It's selling off its capital sports uh, facility. It's looking at a workforce of less than 400 employees in the future. At, the, at its high time, the, the town employed over 2,000 at Barnet Castle with the housing that it has had. You know, GSK is, is contracting. It's shutting its Overson site that supported the Barnet Castle site. The Barnard Sassel site is automating and reducing its workforce continually. Like I say, the target's less than 400 employees. So as the, it's the planning committee that's responsible for, me, for maintaining that uh, stability. That's the, that's, that's, the, you know, that's sustainability is the brand image. You know, the offer of short-term jobs to counter off the, out the, the, the GSK jobs does, doesn't make sense. You've got to maintain the tourism industry. Um, you know, local employ local builders are fully occupied at the moment with non-impactful, low infill developments. This goes in head, it goes against that. So I know my time's up and I just want to get that strong opinion about. One further question, could Barry Gilbert just outline his relationship with the plan with the, the, the seller, the owner of the land, as I as I believe that should be questioned as well. And the fraudulent activity of banks in doing this certainly Mr. needs investigation. Mr. Mr. Coulthard, I, I couldn't get my microphone to come in and it wouldn't let me in. Mr. Coulthard, you can't say them things about offices. You can't say that about things. And certainly I will not allow Mr. Gilbert to comment on that question. We've got to dis, dis, totally disregard that last question. I do apologise, Barry. I couldn't get in. Me, me, your microphone wouldn't unmute. Can we move yeah. straight on to Mr. Thank Jump? you very much for your time. Mr. Jubb. Mr. Gordon Jupp, are you there? I'll ask again, Mr. Jupp, are you there? I can't find you on the attendees, I have to say, but I'm told you did click in. If not, Barry, I don't think you should answer any of them questions commented there because that, clearly I ruled them out. Can we then move on to banks as themselves? Good morning, Ms. Lomax. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Lomax, Senior Development Planner at the Banks Group, a family-owned business established 43 years ago here in County Durham. We are experienced in bringing forward quality developments like the one before you today. We fully support your planning officer's detailed report, which recommends approval of this application. We've worked closely with your officers over the last two years to bring forward this carefully designed development in accordance with policies in the recently adopted County Durham Plan. I'd like to highlight the environmental, social and economic benefits that this project will bring. As a main market town, Barnard Castle is a very sustainable location for new homes. This site is the most suitable option for new housing, lying in walking distance of both primary and secondary schools with existing capacity. It is directly on a bus route. Electric vehicle charging points will be installed in every home and biodiversity on the site will be improved with tree planting, hedgerow enhancement and habitat creation. Many local people have told us that there are a shortage of new and affordable homes in Barnard Castle. As the North East English Chamber of Commerce has highlighted in their letter of support, quality housing supports local economy and affordable housing is particularly important to ensure that everyone can access the housing ladder. This development will provide a range of new houses 
including bungalows and affordable homes to meet the needs of the whole community. The economic benefits of our development are substantial. Your decision today would unlock construction investment of £17 million in the county. Approval would create around 60 full-time jobs during the three-year construction period and a further 90 jobs indirectly. The new homes would generate an additional £190,000 council tax annually and an estimated £1.4 million retail spending per year to support local businesses in Barnard Castle. At a time of unprecedented economic upheaval, we need investment such as this to create jobs and give confidence to businesses. We understand that some local people may have genuine concerns about our plans. It's been disheartening, however, to see a great number of objections coming from residents of the adjacent housing estate who had the opportunity to benefit from a new home themselves when this development was built only a few years ago. Your officers, along with statutory consultees, have diligently assessed our application to ensure that all the issues raised by objectors have been considered and resolved before reaching their recommendation for approval. Yeah, well, thanks, I hope thanks. that you will acknowledge the compelling benefits of our Darlington Road development and that you support your officer's recommendation today. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have regarding any matters raised. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms Lomax. Can we now move on to Ms Laura Hunter? You've got one minute, Ms Hunter. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, ma'am. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a local resident. I've lived in Barncastle and the surrounding villages my whole life, um, or 33 years of it. Um, I'm trying to purchase my first home in the town at the moment. Um, contrary to some views that have been subject to um, discussion already today, there is a need for housing in County Durham and Barney is not exempt from this. Barnard Castle and Teasel have a wider population of 25,000 residents, yet as of this morning, there is a total of six two and three bedroom houses for sale in the town under £250,000. To me, this clearly demonstrates the lack of housing supply and choice, especially for first time buyers. A number of smaller family homes seconds. in the town have routinely been purchased as retirement and holiday homes. This further reduces supply and pushes up prices. The lack of homes will affect school viability and the health of the town centre. I'm dismayed that residents in the Castle Vale estate are now objecting to newer built houses next door to them. <laughs> I, I note their comments that the loss of view from their property is upsetting. However, this is not a right, which is a material planning matter, as members will be aware. I fully support the officer's recommendation for approval and would urge members to consider housing needs of the whole town, including younger generations, to ensure that we all have a fair chance to buy a home and raise our Thank families you. here. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Hunter. I'm sorry you had to wait all that long time for one minute. Um, okay. I've got a letter from Paula Shepherd, but we will be bringing in Mr Gordon Jupp. He's, he's, he's now arrived, so I'll, I will bring him back in. But before we get to Mr. Jupp, I will bring in the county solicitor. So, Ian, could you read the letter from Paula Shepherd? Yes, Chair, this is a letter from Paula Shepherd, who is a local resident of Barnard Castle. She says, I support this planning application and ask you to do the same. As a mother and resident of Barnard Castle, I would like my children to have the opportunity to be able to live in Barnard Castle. Currently, local children usually have to move out of the town to buy or rent their first home. New affordable homes are needed so that Barnard Castle does not just become a retirement town. It needs to be a vibrant town with young families and people. <clears throat> Members will recall staff with primary school closed largely because of a lack of children caused by a lack of homes nearby that families could afford to buy or rent. This project will create nearly 100 jobs during the construction phase and ongoing work for local tradespeople, including plumbers, electricians, landscape gardeners, etc. I have a number of friends who have businesses in the town and know how much they've struggled throughout the last year. It seems nonsensical to me to turn away such private investment at this crucial time. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person, but unfortunately I am at work. I'd be very grateful if you could take them into account and vote in favour of this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Neil, I did say I would bring you back in, but to be fair to Councillor Mr Wilkes, he wants to make a point of order. So it would make sense to take the point of order in case I'd need to come back to you for legal advice on that. So I haven't forgotten what you wanted, but um, uh, Mark, would you like to come in? So can I just say Sorry. before you come in to members of the public, the chat is basically so that members of the committee can report request to speak. 
members of the committee don't we don't have conversations in that paragraph and certainly once a member of the public has spoken that is the end of it thank you very much councillor mr wilkes sorry chair my point of order was at the point when uh, i felt that one of the uh, speakers was being disrespectful to the committee and to a specific council officer and i felt it was inappropriate and you also and then you then stated that um, my RTS is, is related to wanting to speak after everyone else has, uh, has had their say, Chair. Thing. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for your support. C Neil, can you come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Chair, again, it was it was really just in, in support of what you'd said. Um, clearly inappropriate for um, a, an objector to um, attack or question the, the integrity of the, the planning officer on this. Um, and also, Related to that, again, I just wanted to point out that, you know, anybody can can comment on a planning application, even employees of the the, the, the applicant. You know, the, the fact that somebody is employed by the applicant doesn't operate as a as a moratorium um, on on submitting comments. Thank you, Neil. Neil, if it was a member as well as officer, I would defend their integrity. And that's why I ruled that that would not go any further. We're all entitled to integrity. And as I say, I apologise for Barry that my microphone didn't bring me in earlier. Right. Can I go back to Mr. Jupp? Mr. Jupp, can you come in? You're, you're speaking in an objection. Are you still there, Mr. Jupp? I've got a hand up and a message saying you're there that you're going to speak for two and a half minutes. Mr. Jupp? Neil, I've tried again to get Mr. Jupp, and I, 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 the problem is I will now be moving on to members. Is it Mr. Jupp? Can you speak, please? Chair Howard's telling to unmake his microphone. You right. If you unmake your microphone, like Councillor Shield has said, that would then allow you to speak. Can you speak now? Chair, his microphone isn't on mute. I didn't think it was, and what I could see, it wasn't on mute. Um, right, Mr. Jupp, for the last, I'm afraid I play you to, I don't take this wrong, but I need to move on because I've got members lining up asking questions, wanting to comment. It'll be the last call, Mr. Jupp, for you to, to enter the meeting. Do we have anything in writing from Mr. Jupp that in case he didn't, his connection failed, it would read out, Ian? I haven't been supplied with anything, Chair. Barry, has anything been supplied to officers that if that is, his connection broke, that it would to read out? No, no, I haven't got a statement to read out, Chair. Right. He's saying, because I wonder if he must have heard me say it, so he must be able to hear me, because he just said, read my objection, but you haven't got it there to read. So, for the last time, Mr. Juff, can you try and undo your microphone? Chair, Chair the, the only other thing we, I, I could suggest in, in these circumstances, if Mr. Mr. Jubb, who, who can clearly hear, hear the, the proceedings, whether he could potentially send um, that objection now um, to, to, um, to either dem services or the, the the planning officer to to be read out i mean that's that i think that's the only thing we could do is give them the opportunity to to um to email that now to to be read out now clearly you, you may not be able to do that or, or time may not allow but i think that's that's probably the only the only thing we can do in in these circumstances other than move on to the to the members debate yeah that's it okay so mr Jupp, have you heard what's been said could you email to andrew can you email to andrew.inch at durham.gov.uk and then Andrew will read it out for us.
Right, I'm advised. Andrew, you should have that email. Thank you, Mr Judd, for working with us. I used your name, Andrew, because it felt easier to spell than Galvillet, etc. So that's why I picked on you. No problem, Chair. Just waiting for it to come through. Here we go. To you now. I'll just open it. OK, I've got it now, Chair. Thank you. I'm speaking as I feel it important that you heard an alternative perspective to that set out by the applicant and to highlight just some of the disinformation that's been circulated. I would reiterate that this site has not been allocated under the County Durham plan, yet this application attempts to bypass those restrictions using policy six. However, the land is greenfield and is included in the county areas of high landscape value. This proposal encroaches on that and will negatively impact the locality. The location is therefore inappropriate. The transport assessment just does not tell the full story. There are regular queues of traffic and attendant delays at the A67, A688 junction. There will be significant adverse impact on journeys. The transport assessment suggests 78% of traffic will turn right towards the town. I suggest that the issue has not been properly scrutinised. A traffic survey conducted last December during a lockdown with closed schools is hardly a typical scenario. The site is within walking and cycling distance of the town centre and facilities. However, the reality is that the vast majority of trips would be undertaken by motor vehicle. This is quite clear from observed behaviour at Ash Tree Drive. Bus services are not comprehensive or suitable for regular commuting to outlying workplaces. The first westbound bus is not until 9.26am. There are no dedicated facilities for cyclists. The application does not provide for, for any and Darlington Road is a trunk road. I regularly cycle from Castle Vale, but only for leisure. The layout and terrain make it impractical for regular commuting or amenity trips. If walking, bus use or cycling to amenities is not practical, then the development does not have good access to sustainable modes of transport. An electric car charging point and bike stores do not make a house sustainable. Banks have been asked for more details, yet they have declined to provide any on a number of occasions. I would draw attention to the attempts by the applicant to garner support for the application. Planning have received 156 supporting comments. The vast majority of these are in a standard format and had been generated from the applicant's website. More striking is the fact that of these, only 28 are from Barnard Castle and at least 52 are from Banks employees. Banks Group core value is proclaimed as development of care, a, not a noble sentiment, but sadly lacking in this case. Letters in local newspapers and press releases have criticised anyone opposing their plans, even suggesting recently that residents are not being fair. Andrew, I've been advised that you've got 30 seconds. Perhaps banks should consider if they're being fair by imposing another 100 houses on top of the 400 already built in the last few years. Those voicing concerns clearly feel there'll be negative effects by the development. Why else would they oppose them? Trying to silence opposition is unwarranted. I'll just sum up at the end here. Um, weight of public opinion is against the proposal. This application is speculative, cynical and profiteering. Much is promised, but without substance. Banks will not be constructing, but will sell the site, move on and not be accountable. It can be argued strongly that the application does not meet the criteria for policy six and should be rejected. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to bring you to a halt, Andrew, but we had to keep everybody else to the time, including that young lady. So therefore, it had to be done carefully. Once again, thank you to everybody, Andrew, for accommodating that and Mr Jupp for doing that. So we now move on. I've got one member at the moment asking to speak, and that's Councillor Mr Wilkes. Mark? Thanks, thank Chair. Thank you, Mr Jupp. Um, I have a few comments, but I've got, I've got a question first of uh, planning officers in relation to... Um, Policy 15, addressing housing need, because within the conditions, 
I don't see a specific statement that 60% of the dwellings on this site must be built to the um, M42 accessible and adoptable dwelling standard. Am I to assume that this is just now an assumption that we have that, uh, that every new development of more than five properties that comes forward will have this in place? Because clearly the, the, the suggestion is that um, there is a potential need for things like bungalows um, within the Barnard Castle area and for housing for more elderly people. Just want to be absolutely certain that the developer will be required to provide that 60% of accessible and adoptable dwelling standard. And then I've got some comments, Chair. Barry? Barry would like to come in. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at the report now. Um, condition number eight um, does require that no development shall commence until a scheme to detail how 66% of the number of dwellings comply with the M42 accessible and adaptable dwellings. Um, condition number nine um, states that the development hereby approved shall provide 10% of level access flats, level access bungalows, or another housing product um, that would meet the needs of a multi-generation family. So those conditions are uh, contained in the report, Chair. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Barry. So we go back to Mark. Yeah, we've sorry, comments, I, I and then we've got I, 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 After you, Mark, that. we've got, after you, we've got Councillor Richardson and Councillor Tinsley. Mark? Sorry, Chair. Yeah, I missed that section there. Um, okay, so I think my starting point with this, and I haven't made a final decision yet, I want to listen to other members, is um, what's the point of the county plan? It's just been passed. We've got housing supply of, of over five years already available. We've got housing developments that are going to come forward on land, which is already um, there in the county plan. Um, there's been 400 additional houses we're told already built in Barnard Castle, some still going on. Um, and I do think it's a, it, it's unfair to say that when somebody's moved into a house, that doesn't give them the, give them the right to then object to a development in the town where they then live. Um, and, and and I think and 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 one of the objectors, sorry, one of the um, supporters also commented there were only six two to three bedroom properties for sale in Barnard Castle. Well, on right move right now, there's 16. Um, and there's 33 houses for sale in Barnard Castle. Um, NPPF 14 is the element of this that I really want to just, just comment on, um, the climate change element of things. And, um, and we're told that there's going to be electric charging points for these properties. And if I'm looking at overall on balance, whether I agree or disagree with this application, this is one of two things that I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to look at myself at the moment because this site has no solar panels, no ground source heat pumps, no air source heat pumps. There's no requirement, there's no uh, intention for any sustainable heating. So my assumption is that we're going to put 100 houses with gas boilers, which actually are all going to um, be phased out in, 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 a, in a couple of years, according to the government. Um, I expect sustainable to mean sustainable. And, and I don't see that as being the case with this development. Um, and, and NPPF 14 also expects us to convert things like existing buildings as, as priority. Well, Teesdale's got over 300 empty properties. There's, there's over 108 in the DL 12-8 postcode area, which is the immediate area of Barnard Castle and around there. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking what we've got here is just somebody coming along and just trying it on, in effect, to try and build when we already know where we're supposed to be having housing over the next few years. Um, and, and the policy 39 element of this, I, I don't believe that this development is, is, is fit for purpose. I believe it is a countryside development. I accept what um, one of the local members said, that when you actually look from above at where this housing is, it does move housing closer to, the, to a neighbouring settlement. So whilst I, I fully respect and support officers not being insulted in the way that some some have been today, I'm afraid I don't agree at the moment with the principle of this development going ahead, but I'd like to hear what other members' comments are. Thank you, Mark. We'll go straight to George and Fraser and then go back to Barry. George? Thank you, Mr Chairman. 
Uh, <clears throat> some of my colleagues will be glad to know that I am going to be consistent. This is a green field site. It would be loss of a good agricultural field. I can only reiterate what's been said. For once, I, I agree with uh, Mark Wilkes. He's, he's just about summed it up. It's not in the schla. It's unacceptable to policy 39, harm to the character of the area. The parish council objects it's, uh, as overdevelopment and urban, urban sprawl. And someone mentioned that the highway, and it's not where it would access the road, it's where it comes into Barnard Castle. And then the town becomes then clogged up with, with vehicles, yes. So I can't support this. I'm sorry, Mr Chairman, thank you. Thank you, George. Now we move to Fraser. Thank you, John. And just before I start, can I just uh, correct something that Councillor Wilkes said there? I've just checked right move. And uh, what the uh, submission from the member of the public was that there were only six houses under the price of £250,000. And uh, I'd just advise uh, Mark to go back and, and have another look and put £250,000 in as the maximum price uh, before he kind of casts uh, certain aspersions on people making submissions to this uh, committee. Uh, thank you. But just to move on, um, first point is I think we have to accept that uh, Barnard Castle is a place where people want to live, people aspire to live there. It's a place where people want their children to be able to live. And uh, it's a place where we've seen a lot of investment uh, in recent years. We saw a recent a retail scheme that came through this committee within the last uh, year or so. Barnard Castle has a lot of facilities that other similar towns across County Durham don't have. So I think it is um, important that we, uh, we were aware of that. And finally, if you do look at the site location of this, it, it does appear what, what would be a logical extension to the urban area of Barnard Castle. It's extending a re recently developed uh, uh, area for uh, uh, residential development. So I, I do see that logic in terms of extending it. Then we move on to the, sort of some of the bigger picture stuff. And we always have to remember that the government have a target which they're failing to meet, of building 300,000 houses uh, in England. And yes, we've got a, a county plan as Councillor Bell and uh, Councillor Wilkes have identified recently adopted, and that's a much stronger position for us uh, than we were in on this committee uh, until recently. But we have to remember as well, looking at that, we've identified the need for 25,000 houses in County Durham up to 2035, and we've only allocated uh, 5,470 houses. Now, you might think there's, there's a mismatch there, but this plan has been approved by a planning inspector and in place by the Secretary of State. So we have taken the right approach. And I think this does include with policy six as well, and also policy 39. Um, first of all, Councillor Bell's comments about the Schla, just remind Councillor Bell, the Schla is not part of the development plan, which is the primary consideration in the determination of this application. Policy 39 and the landscape inside of things. I've looked at the indicative layout and the proposals around the SUD scheme. I think it's a it's a, the, the density of the development means there is scope for a strong uh, landscape and proposal here. So I am content that uh, that, that is going to be a, a strong boundary to the settlement. And I would agree with our landscape officers in that regard. But then we move on to, to policy six, which is the real substance here. Um, the criteria run from A down to J. I think criteria D is the key one, scale design layout. Uh, I would concur with the officers uh, with the fact that it complies with that criteria and the other criteria in the policy. So I think that's something that um, this is an instance where policy six should be invoked and uh, there is a justification for this scheme. But I do understand that um, people have concerns with development and uh, I do understand that people feel that there may be a pressure on, on resources in the area. The schools, I'm content, officers have recommended that there are places available, that's positive. And really I would ask what more can we do as a planning authority than to consult with the NHS and ask them if there is capacity and if they say yes, how can we say that there isn't when they've provided us with the statement that there is and there is a, a contribution being made towards that. So I think if we look in the context of 
Policy six, the overall need for housing, the sustainability of Barnet Castle as a settlement, and uh, all of the issues into consideration. And yes, it is disappointing, you know, some of the objections are from, from those close by. And I did take a look at the, the planning commission for the Taylor Wimpy scheme, and there is a striking similarity between the objections to that scheme, which was submitted back in 2012, and this scheme uh, that we're considering today. But I think on, on balance, and looking at it, uh, this is a scheme that I, I would uh, support. And uh, I'll remove, I will move uh, that we would accept the, the officer's recommendation and grant permission for this development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Barry, uh, unless you're going to be really upset, I wasn't going to bring you back in because the members so far were just comments rather than specific questions. So I was going to go straight on to the, the next three members. Could I, could I just respond to a couple of points uh, quickly? Yes, um, just in terms of um, where the, the, the letters of support came from, um, it does note in paragraph 79 of the report that the vast majority um, are from outside of the uh, Barnard Castle area and they are standard letters, but obviously members will see fit to give them the weight that they need be, but that was noted in the report. It was. Uh, um, in terms of sustainability, uh, we do have a, a 2018 settlement study which considered Barnard Castle, Castle to be the 10th in the whole county uh, on a scoring matrix, which considered factors such as businesses, employment, education, health and leisure, etc. So it is considered to be in a sustainable location. Um, in terms of it not being an allocated site, yes, that's correct. Obviously, policy six is there for a reason. And we have looked through all of the criteria in policy six and officers feel that it does uh, meet the requirements of, of all those criteria and should be accepted um, as an exception in this case. Uh, the last point um, I wanted to make was maybe to bring in Dave Stewart because there was an issue about the timing of the, the, the transport assessment and when that's taken place, if that's OK, yeah. Dave. Yeah, the um, the surveys were done pre-COVID. We've been obviously wouldn't have been logical to do do after that or in the midst of it. So the surveys were definitely done pre-COVID and then growth up as you would expect them to be. And um, the respective turning counts at the proposed junction were based in standard standard industry industry practice for assessment purposes based on census data. So. Um, I just wanted to reassure members that there is no aspect of the transport modelling that was referred to that actually is is undermined in practice. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, David. And for Councillor Tinsley's benefit, you now have a second because Councillor Atkinson has agreed to second. I've got three more to go for, go in this next session and then we'll go to the vote, I think. Councillor Mr Clare, Councillor Mr Shield, Councillor Kay. John, John Clare. <laughs> Um, we just seem to have been telling people off all um, uh, meeting, uh, Chair. Um, I would like to express my disappointment, which I do every time when a council lodges um, a strong objection and then doesn't turn up to explain to us uh, in person. And uh, sort of, uh, I'm unhappy with Marwood Parish Council on that respect. And also, uh, Council, uh, Councillor Rowlandson, it's not an area of outstanding natural beauty, an AONB. It's an area of high landscape value, AHLV. Um, the, um, uh, it's not to be sneezed at being an AHLV. It's something which needs taking into account uh, against development. But nevertheless, um, it would be a far bigger thing if it was an A or N B. Um, I want to comment on a number of things, Chair. Um, I will just comment on the Schla uh, that I do believe that when the inspector judged the uh, County Durham plan, one of his comments was that um, sort of we were far too prescriptive um, in our housing allocation sites, and we had to give more. Um, uh, ground uh, to um, uh, sort of windfall um, applications. Now, if I'm wrong on that, I do apologise to everybody, but I seem to remember that. Um, the fact is, is that there is a need for housing. People are scre screaming at us all the time for extra housing. Um, the second thing I'll comment about what Councillor Wilkes said about EV points, I absolutely, I welcome 
this as the climate change champion. Um, I do appreciate what Councillor Bulk said that 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 must not just be um, uh, a thing that they, they throw out and then uh, the things are very poorly um, insulated, etc. Um, and but I would draw Councillor Wilkes' um, attention to another <laughs> to, to to another condition, condition nineteen, uh, where it says quite clearly the reserved matter submission of layout, appearance, and scale can be accompanied by a scheme demonstrating how the development will achieve reduction in CO two emissions. And so I would uh, very much hope. Uh, that banks will take um, what councillors said into cognizance when they're discussing with officers and officers will apply at least the requirements of the county Durham uh, plan in responsible uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in that. And finally, uh, Chair, I would just ask um, banks when they're talking about local employment um, that uh, they would um, use local procurement wherever possible and uh, that, that this might be um, that they might use uh, local subcontractors and things like that. Um, mm. That's all I've got to say. I will be um, voting in favour uh, of, of this, uh, Councillor Robinson, unless I hear something which completely um, uh, blows everything out of the water. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John Isabel. Thank you. I've got Councillor Shield, then Councillor Kit, and then I will allow Councillor Wilkes to come back on a question on the Schlar as it's just been referred to. But I did say Alan and Jolly would go first. Alan? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Another um, tenuous application requiring very careful consideration of the planning balance. There are some compelling arguments for this application to be supported. The sustainability, the shortage of affordable housing, and whilst it's concerning to hear about the local employment being reduced, it does provide the three-year construction for employees. And we all recognise that Barnet Castle is a desirable place to live. However, I am concerned at the consideration for policy six. Yes, it provides that flexibility. And yes, it allows the officers time and judgment to make their opinions known. But where do we draw the line? If we consider 100 houses is not considered to be a small site, but is acceptable. Where do we draw the line? So next time it's not 100, it's 120 or 150 or 200. If rules have to be complied with, then rules have to be complied with within given guidelines. So I have some serious concerns on the interpretation of that. I also have some interpretation on policy 39 and policy 10. There is a consideration that this development is actually outside the curtilage of the existing village and is heading towards a coalescence of the adjoining properties. That also needs to be taken very carefully into consideration. So to say again, Chair, it is the planning balance. I'm not fully minded as to which way I intend to, um, to vote on this application and will await the following officers uh, comments and also any other members views before making my judgment thank you thank Chair. you thank you alan we now move on Car councillor care Car charlie and then councillor wilkes charlie thank you chair um unless i'm unless i'm uh, completely mistaken chair if we look at page uh, just bear with me i don't have my glasses on if we look at page 77 no is it 77 yeah, 77 of 104, this is an outline application with all matters reserved apart from access. And I've heard grandstanding this morning. They're talking about ground source heat pump, policy six, the SLA, et cetera, et cetera. Yet this is an outline application with all matters reserved apart from access. Now, am I getting a little tired, a little crotchety? It's been a long morning. No. I'm just making a point and I'd like clarification. What are we voting on here? Are we voting on what's in the application? Bearing in mind, by the way, this is only here because it's been called in by the local member. Are we voting on what's on the application, which is outline plan, plan, planning application 
with all matters reserved apart from access, or are we voting on what sounds to me like a full planning application here? Can I have a little bit of clarification? You will, Councillor Wilkes, uh, Councillor uh, Kay, after Councillor Wilkes asks his question on Schlar, because I'll go to Barry and get your answer and I'll get the Schlar answer. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to highlight paragraph uh, 98, uh, where um, in Schlar, this site's down as um, location 6 backslash BC21. And there's a statement being put in by um, the officers. The development of this site would compromise an incursion into attractive open countryside beyond newly established settlement edge, not well related to existing settlement form and with greater prominence and impact than development to the west. When you look at the intramap system for the council, it's it's got a typology of greenfield 100% and a yield estimate of 125. But at the bottom, it has this exact statement there with one additional sentence removed from the report, which says likely to have a significant landscape effect, bracket significant adverse residual impact. So in terms of whether we are deciding the, uh, the, more, the more detailed aspects of this application, uh, what I would point out is that we're looking at, at this stage, uh, as Councillor Atkinson's just asked this question, we're looking at the principle of whether this site should be developed at all. And our own system states likely to have significant landscape impacts and adverse residual impact. So I feel almost as though, an officer may be able to clarify to me, that we make statements, we come up with policy, we set what our views are, and then when an application comes for a site that this council has previously said and the officers have previously said is, is unacceptable, we then change our minds. I, I don't agree with that. I, I mean, open to the officer to, to comment, but we've said that this shouldn't be developed on because it's going to have a serious, significant landscape impact. Um, I don't understand why we then come along and change our minds when we've already got sufficient housing um, in the pipeline in this area and in the county. Thank you, Mark. So you've got two main areas to concentrate there, I, I think, Barry. One is the SLA and also the point made by Councillor Mr K in regards to the, the actual application itself. Yes, thanks, Chair. Just to um, comment on Councillor Kerr's point. It, yes, it is an outline application. So what we're looking at here is planning permission in principle for the development of up to 100 houses within the red line uh, site boundary. So if it does get approved today, uh, reserve matters would deal with appearance, scale, layout, landscaping, um, and we'd look at the, the things like sustainability in terms of specifics on site later in the stage. This is really only looking at um, planning permission in principle for the development of the site for housing. In terms of the SLA, I think the SLA was developed to inform policy four and it would inform um, officers judgment on where housing sites should be allocated in the county. It doesn't look at specific site proposals. So in this case, when the, the applications come in, obviously officers have assessed it. And when we've looked at the landscape visual impact assessment, and what the suggested mitigation is, officers have considered that to be acceptable. Um, so yes, the SLA looked broadly at um, whether in principle housing sites would be acceptable, but it doesn't look at um, individual detailed planning applications. When we've seen where what's been presented to us, we feel on balance that is, that is an acceptable proposal. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Councillor Atkinson, Jim, I think that was a slip of the tongue from Mark Council. He said Councillor Atkinson when I think he meant Councillor Kerr. So, so don't, there's nothing to get upset about, Jim, in the chat line. OK, so we now move on. I've got a proposal by Council Mr Tinsley, seconded by Council Mr Atkinson, that we approve, we, we vote to approve. Neil, can you take over and do the formal voting for me?
Yes, thank you, Chair. So once again, I'll, I'll come to, to each member um, and ask which way you're voting. Um, I'll only ask if you're for or against, but if you if you want to abstain, um, just let me know at that stage. So this is a, a vote on the, the motion to approve the application um, in accordance with the, the officer recommendation subject to the, the 106 and other obligations set out in the report um, and the, the conditions that are also set out in the officer's report. Um, so I'll come to Councillor Atkinson first. Are you for or against? Yes, Chair, just to clear up there, I, I was just saying I hadn't asked a question. I certainly wasn't upset by anything. Uh, and I'm in favour of Councillor Tinsley's proposal. Thank you. So next, Councillor Bell, are you for or against? Alan, are you there? Alan Bell? Yeah, I'm not sure if he's if, he, if he's got some IT difficulties, but perhaps we can we can move on to the others, and I'll I'll come back to to yes, Councillor Bell at the end. Um, so next, um, Councillor Clare, are you for or against? I'm for. Thank you, uh, Councillor Corrigan, for or against? For. Thank you, Councillor Hawley, are you against. for or against? Thank you. Against. Uh, Councillor Jewell. For. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kay. Four. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Four. Thank you. Councillor Richardson. Against. Thank you. Councillor Shield. A reluctant against. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shuttleworth. Four. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Councillor Simpson, are you still with us? Again, Chair, I'll, I'll just move on for now and, um, and give Councillor Simpson some more time. Uh, yes. Councillor Tinsley, are you for or against? Sorry, Councillor for. Tinsley. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilkes, are you for or against? Against. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson, for or against? Four. So, Chair, I'm going to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Chair, I'm going to come back to Councillor Bell um, and, and give him another opportunity to, to vote on this. So, Councillor Bell, are you, are you for or against? Besides function for members present or not, has got Councillor Alan Bell no response and Councillor Arnold Simpson no response, which would suggest they've left the yeah. meeting. OK, thank you, Chair. So on, on that basis, then, we've got nine in favour of the motion and four against. Thank you very much, therefore, that we've accepted and approved their officer's recommendation on that one. I've got no other business. I've got nothing for Part B, but I would like to make a comment. This morning, we've had many officers from several disciplines of this council and certain comments have been made about the officers. I, on behalf of the County Planning Committee, want to reassure all our officers from all disciplines that they have the complete support of the authority. And when we make a decision on planning, it is purely upon planning policy, planning reasons, not upon individual council members and, I, and staff. And I wish to formally apologise for any upset that has been given to any member of either the council or of the officers. Can, mm -hmm. I ask now, can I now ask that all members remain until we're advised well that the chair. meeting is finished? To well, the said, of the public, thank you. well said, Chair. Thank you.